Hello. We're calling in your neighborhood to tell people that the Bible has solutions for the problems in the world today. You know, we have divorce, broken homes, and sorrow all around us. But God has promised us a wonderful new world in which we will all be happy. If you have a few moments, we'd like to step in and demonstrate our free home Bible study. <laughs> well, the Bible study is uh, free. There's no obligation. Yeah, all right. Come on in. Thank you. <clears throat> oh, did you like a beer? Uh, no, thank you. No, <laughs> guess not. Well, let's uh, let's get acquainted. Uh, I'm Leo Stern, and this is uh, Ralph James. How do you do? And you're uh, Joe. Joe Simpson. Well, Joe, uh, do you have a Bible of your own? Uh, yeah, I think so. Oh, yeah. The reason it's hard for many people to understand the Bible is because of the archaic English used. Uh, this modern version will make it much easier. What we'll do is to read a paragraph from this book and then answer the question at the bottom of the page and then look up the scripture cited in your new Bible. <clears throat> okay. see from scripture in heaven Jesus was Michael the archangel and then he became the man Jesus on earth he lived a perfect life redeemed us and after his resurrection by Jehovah God he again became Michael the archangel in heaven oh hi Stan this is Joe Simpson hi Joe glad to meet you I I've heard you're in need of a job yeah that's right all right, I can put you on with my carpet cleaning crew. Really? You bet. Oh, great. Okay, okay. I'll talk to you Nice after. talking to you. Thanks. Uh, you? Well, I think you're right, Stan. Stan. I want to commend you on your good progress with our studies. However, knowing that the time is short before Armageddon, you need to grow stronger in Jehovah's organization. 
I want to enroll you in the Kingdom Ministry School and uh, train you for the door-to-door -door work so that you'll be sure to be found in Jehovah's favor at Armageddon. I just don't know if I can, Leo. Huh? I know Jehovah requires this of me. I know I have to work out my salvation in his organization. So, I'll try. But Good. I'm very nervous about it. I'm going to be reading from the book of Philippians, chapter 2, verses 13 through 16. For God is the one that, for the sake of his good pleasure, is acting within you in order for you both to will and to act. Keep doing all things free from... Mom, um. Hello. We're calling briefly in your neighborhood to share with you a couple of articles from our latest magazines, from The Awake and The Watchtower. This one has a very interesting article. It's called, What is the Purpose of Life? Isn't that what everyone wants to know? Soon I could do presentations at the ministry school without stuttering and felt I was getting good training for going out in the field service. Brother Leo was a great encouragement to me and everyone was very kind and helpful. Thank you. Would you like to make a contribution of 70 cents? Certainly. Soon the day came when Brother Leo took me out doing magazine work. I was sure I wouldn't do well, but the very first morning, a nice lady took the magazines and Brother Leo showed me how to fill out the territory card. That's Very it. good. That's it. Okay. Shortly after, I attended a circuit assembly and was baptized in symbol of my dedication to Jehovah and his organization. Now I really was a recognized Jehovah's Witness with Jehovah God as my father and his visible organization as my mother. I really had a new family, just as Leo had promised. Well, I wrote to Brenda and I told her about my faith in Jehovah and the organization and Armageddon and everything, but she's not interested. She says she's moving away and taking Lisa so that I won't be able to influence her. Well, remember, Joe, we're in her family now. You know, many times Jehovah provides us a new wife and a new family in his organization. Just look at us, Joe. Both our former mates refused to become Jehovah's Witnesses when we did. Now, our marriages broke up over it, but it didn't take us long to find each other in Jehovah's organization. And now we have a strong witness family. Would you like to be my Uncle Joe? <laughs> Hello. We're calling briefly to offer you these two latest magazines. This one has an interesting article. Look, I don't need this. I'm saved, and I'm perfectly happy in my own religion. Most ministry calls were routine, but a few of them stand out in my memory. Excuse me, sir. We're calling briefly in your neighborhood to share with you our latest Awake magazine. Now, this one has a... Okay. It has a very interesting article. Thank you very much, sir. I was proud to be persecuted for righteousness sake, and it just proved to me that we were really in the truth. Excuse me, sir, we're calling briefly. Would you mind if we just kind of left that there for you? We can come back another time. The true servant of Jehovah must be prepared to be fearless in service. Good day, we're calling briefly in your neighborhood with... State, state, boy. State, state. In times like this, we must remember that he who endures to the end is the one that will be saved. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name. I want to pray for the Jehovah's Witnesses that are going door to door in my neighborhood. I pray, Lord, that I will be able to give a good witness to them. And Lord, I pray that they will really be able to see Jesus Christ in me and that I can show them your love.
Good morning. Uh, we're calling briefly on you and your neighbors to share with you God's promise of a righteous new earth. Well, I'm so glad you've come. My name's Beverly Williams, and your name is? Joe Simpson, and this is my friend George Littlewood. Hello. Uh, as I was saying, God has promised us a wonderful new earth. Uh, did you know that this promise was in the Bible? Oh, please go on. Uh, Psalms 37, 10, 11 reads this way. And just a little while longer, and the wicked one will be no more. And you will certainly give attention to his place, and he will not be. But the meek ones themselves will possess the earth, and they will indeed find their exquisite delight in the abundance of peace. So you can see, Mrs. Williams, that soon all the wicked will be gone, and only the meek will remain. Please go on. Um, Revelation chapter... 21 promises new heavens and a new earth and uh, look here at verse 4 and he will wipe out every tear from their eyes and death will be no more neither will mourning nor outcry nor pain be anymore the former things have passed away I'd like to offer you this book you can live forever in paradise on earth uh, along with a free home Bible study I'd be happy to take your book in a moment, but I wondered if, first of all, I could ask both of you a question. You've come to my door because you really believe you're in the true faith. Is this right? Yes, we do believe we are in the only true faith because we are persecuted for our work of publishing the good news of the kingdom. Well, you know, you were so kind to share a couple of scriptures with me. I wonder if I might share one scripture with you. Did you know that the Bible has a test as to whether or not we're in the true faith? I have my Bible here, and maybe you'd like to turn with me to 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 5. Test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves, or do you not recognize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail the test? And I'm so happy to tell you both this morning that I passed this Bible test for a Christian because I have Jesus Christ in me. Once several years ago when I was at a very low point in my life, I fell on my knees and I asked Jesus Christ to come into my life and into my heart. And he now indwells me. So I'll be very happy to talk with you again. Maybe you'd like to come Wednesday afternoon at 4 o'clock? Just a minute here. Uh, my Bible doesn't say anything about Christ in you. It says Christ is in union with you. Do you have an interlinear New Testament, Joe? You know, one with the Greek words above and the literal English words underneath? Uh, no, I don't have one, but I think I can get one at the Kingdom Hall. Well, why don't you get one and bring it with you when you come on Wednesday afternoon? And I think when we look at the original words, we'll find out that we really can have Christ in us. Well, I, I bought an interlinear Bible at the Kingdom Hall, but was surprised to find that the New World Translation had added words not in the text. We were told our Bible was a very accurate word-for-word -word translation. I wonder if I might ask you a question. Well, of course, that's what we're here for, to answer your Bible questions. Do you believe Jesus Christ is Michael the Archangel? Yes, Jesus Christ is Michael the Archangel, and I can show you where the Bible teaches it. Well, just one scripture that actually calls Jesus Christ Michael the Archangel, it'd be just fine. Well, there isn't actually one scripture that calls Jesus Michael, but uh, we arrive at that truth by uh, a comparison of the scriptures. Well, you know, in Daniel 10.13 here, Joe, it refers to Michael as one of the chief princes. That means he is one of several others like him. I believe Jesus Christ is unique. I can see here, Michael is not unique. Uh, Leo, what do, you, uh, what do you make of that? Uh, give me a few minutes. While we're waiting, uh, Joe, let's just take a look here also at Jude 9. Uh, notice here, Michael the Archangel did not dare rebuke Satan. Tell me, Joe, did Jesus rebuke Satan? Well, of course he did on many occasions. Is it possible then that Michael is who the Bible says he is, an archangel and not Jesus Christ? Uh, come on, Joe, we're uh, leaving. We have another appointment. <laughs> oh, well, listen, I hope you'll come back next week at the same time. And Joe, you just remember, 
If you have the right Jesus Christ, you are right for all eternity. But if you have the wrong Jesus Christ, then you are wrong for all eternity. Hey, why did you lie to Mrs. Williams? We don't have another appointment. It's best to leave when someone is not open to Jehovah's truth. Then why didn't we stay and show her the truth? What about her questions? Why can't we show from the Bible that Jesus is Michael? I'm starting to wonder if he is. We will not be going back next week. She's one of those born-agains and probably has apostate literature against us. Come on, let's go. Hello, Ralph. It's Joe. Uh, look, I was wondering if you could come with me on a call uh, Wednesday afternoon. Uh, Leo doesn't want to call on this lady again, but I feel we should return one more time since we didn't tell her we wouldn't be back. Well, she has a lot of questions. All right, you'll come? Good. Uh, I'll see you then. Okay, bye-bye. So, Joe, have you done any more research on Jesus Christ? Look, Mrs. Williams, Joe knows very well who Jesus Christ is. He is the Son of God, he is inferior to the Father, and he is Michael in the heavens. You know, you Trinitarians, you make me sick with your freakish-looking three-headed God. The Trinity is a doctrine of Satan. Jesus Christ is not God. If I could prove to both of you, out of the Bible, that Jesus Christ is called Almighty God, would you believe it? You can't prove no such thing out of the Bible. Well, let's open our Bibles then to Revelation chapter 1 and verse 8. And let's read it together. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. Who is this? That's plain for anyone to see. That's Jehovah God. My Bible says Jehovah God. Joe, I see that you're using your interlinear Bible. Does it say Jehovah God in the original Greek? No, it says, Lord God. You obviously believe this scripture refers to Jehovah God, since your Bible has inserted that word there. Well, it, it must be Jehovah God, since it is the Almighty speaking. Well, we're all agreed it's the Almighty speaking, so can we all agree that the Almighty calls himself the Alpha and Omega here? Well, yeah. Let's turn over to Revelation chapter 22 and see if we can get further identification on who the Alpha and Omega is. And we must always be sure to read scriptures in their context. So let's pick it up in verse 12. Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to render to every man according to what he has done. I am the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter by the gates into the city. Outside are the dogs, the sorcerers, the immoral persons, the murderers, and the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices lying. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and the morning star. So notice that the Alpha and Omega, the speaker, identifies himself as I, Jesus. No, the speaker changes. Verse 12 is Jesus, uh, verse 13 is Jehovah, and, and the other verses are, are Jesus again. Besides, according to my reasoning book here, the Alpha and the Omega is, is Jehovah God. Now, there was a time when we did teach it could be Jesus, but this, this is the newest light. Well, although your reasoning book may teach that Jesus is not the Alpha and Omega, Jesus himself says right here that he is the Alpha and Omega. However, could we all agree, based on verse 13, that the Alpha and Omega gives himself the title, the first and the last? Yes, verse 13 clearly has the Alpha and Omega calling himself the first and the last. Then let's turn back to Revelation chapter 1 and see if we can get further identification on the first and the last. Revelation 1, verses 13 to 18, contains the vision of the Son of Man. Who is this? 
That's Jesus, of course. Right. And if we read down through the vision to verses 17 and 18, we can clearly identify the first and the last. Look what the Apostle John says in verse 17. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as a dead man, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last and the living one, and I was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. I have the keys of death and of Hades. Who is this? It's Jesus Christ. You are right. It is Jesus Christ. And by his own words, he is the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and Almighty God. And it is Jesus who is speaking in Revelation 1.8 that we began with. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, Jesus Christ, who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. Who are you going to believe, Joe? Jesus Christ or the Watchtower publications? We have to be going, Joe. We have another appointment. Uh, excuse me, uh, who is this appointment with? Where well, are you going? Uh, we just, we have another appointment. Now look, I'm sorry, but I don't believe you have another appointment. Do you think it's right to lie to get out of a Bible discussion? Why don't you stay a few more minutes and let's look at other scriptures calling Jesus God? I'm staying. Okay, then let's turn over to 1 Timothy chapter 1. And yet for this reason I found mercy, in order that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. Now to the king eternal, not created, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Who is this? Well, well verse 16 is Jesus, and verse 17 is Jehovah. If this were so, this amen here would be one verse sooner. And in the early manuscripts, there were no verse divisions. This refers to Jesus Christ and calls him eternal and the only God. Now let's continue on with some more. Joe, we've invited you to this meeting out of a concern for you. We've noticed a tendency on your part to be a bit rebellious to Jehovah's organization. You should not have invited Brother Ralph to go with you on another call to Mrs. Williams after I told you we would not be going back. Now, Brother Ralph confirms that everything she said to you was right out of Christendom. We want your word now that you will never go back to her house. And if you do, you will face disciplinary action by this committee and possible disfellowshipping. You would not want to spend the rest of the time remaining before Armageddon to be cut off from all of us with no one to speak to and facing Jehovah's destruction. I'm sorry, brothers. I... She only spoke out of the Bible. I, I thought we could discuss the Bible with people. I won't go back to her house. Oh. Uh, while you're here... Uh... Could I ask your advice on another matter? I'd like you to listen to this letter from my wife. Dear Joe, since Lisa and I left you, I have done my best to start a new life for myself. However, I have never stopped loving you, although we could not seem to make a go of our marriage in the past. I was almost ready to return when you sent the news that you had become a Jehovah's Witness, and this is what you saw for your future. I know I could never be one, as I could not see raising Lisa with no Christmases, no birthday celebrations, and no family gatherings on holidays, since Jehovah's Witnesses consider all these things wrong. I was so miserable that I even prayed to God for help. One Sunday I took Lisa and went to church. There the pastor gave us an invitation for all those who would like to receive Jesus Christ as their personal Savior to come forward. With tears in my eyes, I asked God for forgiveness of my sins and asked Jesus to give me a new life. Joe, 
God has been faithful to come into my heart when I invited him in, and now dwells in me. Joe, I just know that with Christ in our hearts and in our home, we could be a happy family once more. Please write and tell me you still love me and want us all together again. I love you, Joe. Lisa sends her love. And most importantly, Jesus loves you too. We're anxiously waiting for your reply. Love, Brenda. Well, brothers, what should I do? See, I want my family back very bad. Joe, if she wanted a reconciliation and was willing to serve Jehovah, of course, we would encourage you to have her back. Or, or Joe, if, if she was just a worldly person, uh, but willing to let you remain a Jehovah's Witness without interference, even then we would let you take her back. Joe, this will be hard for you. It would have been better if you had taken a sister to be your wife in the organization. Jehovah has provided you with plenty of single sisters to choose from, but you never did. Yes, I never did, because I love Brenda. And I always prayed we'd be together again as a family. I'm sorry, brothers. I need more time to think about this. Joe, Joe, you can't take her back, Joe. She, she's a born again like Mrs. Williams. Joe, you must remain loyal to Jehovah's organization. She's of the devil, Joe! Lisa! Daddy, Daddy. Oh, Joe, I tried to wait for your letter, but I just felt the Lord was leading us to come. You did the right thing. Brenda, I'm so confused. I dedicated my life to Jehovah God. I've done all the things this organization expects of me. I've gone to five meetings a week. I met quotas out in field service. I always felt everything was perfectly right until just lately. Now I'm having my doubts. The elders won't be happy with me now that you're here. And then there are all those questions Mrs. Williams raised. Don't be upset with me. I sent off for some information from some people that used to be Jehovah's Witnesses. But they left when they found out the leaders of the Watchtower were false prophets. Did you know that for more than a hundred years they've been falsely prophesying the end of the world? All these references are from the Watchtower publications. Wouldn't you be willing to check this out in the Kingdom Hall Library? Maybe I should have done more investigation at the start. I wish we could just talk to Mrs. Williams. But I gave my word I wouldn't go back to her house. Why can't we invite her to our house? You never promised we couldn't do that. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, I ask you now to anoint me with your Holy Spirit for this encounter. I take my authority as a believer in Jesus Christ, and I bind that spirit of deception operating in Joe's life. I ask you, Lord, to convict him of the error of his ways, and welcome him into your kingdom, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. I can no longer deny Jesus is called God in the Bible because I did what you suggested. I, I got a concordance and I looked up every scripture. I also proved to myself that there is only one true God. I know Jesus cannot be a God or an extra God. But I still don't understand why Jesus said in John 14, 28 that the Father was greater than him. Doesn't that make Jesus inferior, as the Watchtower teaches? Well, remember, Joel, how we proved from the Bible that Jesus Christ is Almighty God and the only God? Yes, and I believe the Bible is true. Well, when dealing with the subject of Jesus Christ, we have to consider two aspects. One is the deity of Jesus Christ, that is, that he is truly God. The other aspect is that he is truly man, his humanity. Turn with me to Philippians chapter 2, and let's begin reading together in verse 5. 
Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. Now, Jehovah's Witnesses immediately ignore the first phrase, take the second one and say, you see, he, he didn't even want to be equal with God. He wanted to be inferior. But that's not what the scripture is saying. Instead of Jesus grasping after what he already had, he did something else instead. And picking it up in verse 7, if you follow along, he did this. But he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. So Jesus, although he never ceased being in the form of God, at a certain point in time, and for a little while, he emptied himself, he humbled himself, he took the form of a man, and he functioned perfectly as a man to buy back what Adam had lost. You know, I think Colossians chapter 2 and verses 8 and 9 will clear up that wrong teaching from Jehovah's Witnesses that Jesus was only a man on earth. Would you like to read that, Joe? See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception, according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. For in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. In him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. All is all. Full is full. Christ is truly deity, even in the flesh. It's no wonder that Acts 20.28 20, says that God purchased the church with his own blood. Jesus, I always believed that I couldn't pray to you, but now I am. And although I don't know all the answers, I trust in you. I'm asking you now to come into my life and into my heart and reveal yourself to me. If I have been in a false organization, please forgive me and show me the way to go to serve you. Thank you. Thank you for giving me back my wife and my daughter. Give me the strength to face the elders. And thank you for your free gift of salvation, which I gladly receive. Amen. Leo? Ralph? Do you mind if we come in? No, not at all. We've missed you at the meetings the past two weeks, Joe, and we're concerned about you. And you haven't turned in your field service report this month. I've been preparing myself for a meeting with you. I've gotten back together with my wife, Brenda, and have been devoting every spare moment to Bible study and research into the organization. Where are the Society's publications, Joe? I've set them aside for the moment to study the Bible alone. You can't understand the Bible apart from the Society's publications. If you study the Bible alone, you could become an apostate, or worse, a born-again. I suspect he already is an apostate. Have you been reading apostate literature, Joe? I've examined photocopies of Watchtower publications, showing me that they have falsely prophesied in the name of Jehovah God many times. 
Now, perhaps you would like to check these out. Come on, Ralph, we're leaving. You'll be hearing from the committee on this, Joe. No, no, I don't think I will. Here is my official letter of disassociation from you, including the reasons why. Not the least of which is that you deliberately misrepresented the person of Jesus Christ to me. Now, I've given my life to him, and I will no longer serve your false organization. Don't be late for your next appointment. persecuted for righteousness sake and it just proved to me that we were really in the truth well remember joe we're family now the trinity is a doctrine of satan jesus christ is not so you must remain loyal to jehovah's organization if i have been in a false organization please forgive me and show me the way to go to serve you if you study the bible alone you can become an apostate, or worse, a born again. You deliberately misrepresented the person of Jesus Christ. Oh no, here comes Sister Beagle. I'm so glad I caught you, Brother Stern. I have something serious to report. Oh, I'm sure you do, Sister Beagle. I saw Sister Smith at the shopping center. Joe Simpson was walking toward her and said hello. That apostate has no business trying to speak to us. Anyway, I saw Sister Smith actually nod her head at him. Oh. There was even a suspicion of a smile on her face. I insist you speak with her, Brother Stern. I only report this out of loyalty to Jehovah's organization. You always do, Sister Beagle. All right, I'll have a word with Sister Smith about how to treat this fellowshiped one. She's rather new, so she probably doesn't understand. She's to adore them totally. Come on, Martha, let's go home. Um, Leo, I've got a letter from Marilyn that I want to show you. Martha, you know you're not to be in correspondence with our daughter. 
She's out of Jehovah's organization and is dead to us now. But Leo, please. She's just writing to say that she and Tom are expecting a baby. Our grandchild, Leo. Martha, this is just a test of our loyalty to Jehovah and his organization. We have been strong so far. We can't get soft now. Don't you dare write back to her or contact her in any way, or you could be the next one the committee will have to deal with. You could be the next one to be disfellowshipped yourself. From now on, return her letters unread and unopened, and don't you dare write back. Beverly Williams and I'm calling in the neighborhood concerning the single mothers group home near here we're asking all those concerned with saving babies to help us out with expenses we want those young mothers and their babies to have a good future <laughs> oh it's you what are you doing here upsetting my wife haven't you caused us enough trouble hello mr. Stern I haven't seen you for some time since you missed our last appointment how are you I thought you might like to know that Joe Simpson and his family are doing very well. I know he misses you and would like to see you again. Seeing Joe is out of the question. He's out of Jehovah's organization, thanks to you. You tell him if he repents and comes back to the truth, then I'll see him. So then, Joe, Leo shut the door in my face. <laughs> I'm sorry for that man that he's so bitter, but... I can't forget the look on Mrs. Stern's face. That woman is in some kind of crisis. I have a very strong feeling that I should go back and see if I can help her out. I want to apologize for upsetting her. Well, Beverly, we have both been praying for some time for the Stearns. Perhaps this is the Lord's timing to deal with them. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we pray now for the Stearns that you anoint Bev to minister to them. We come against that spirit of watchtower deception in the name of the Lord, and we ask that you help them to come free in Jesus' name. Amen. I stopped by to apologize for upsetting you the other day. Was it something I said? You'd better come in and I'll explain. See, I received a letter from our daughter Marilyn explaining that she was expecting our first grandchild. Well, that should make you happy, not sad. You don't understand. You see, our daughter married out of our faith, and then she took a job forbidden by our organization. She was disfellowshipped. It broke Leo's heart and mine because now we can't have anything more to do with her. She's dead to us, but she still tries to make contact with us, and, and we can't speak to her. That's bad enough, but now this baby... When you came to my door and mentioned babies, it just set me off. So you can see it wasn't your fault. <sighs> Leo tells me that I have to stop all this grieving and get on with my life, but it's just so hard. I can't imagine my life without my daughter in it. <sighs> you don't know how hard it is. I can't even discuss how I feel with our lifelong friends, or they might turn me into the committee. If I continue to take my daughter's calls or, or, or read her letters... I could be disfellowshipped as well, and I could lose my eternal life in the new earth. Leo himself has threatened to turn me in if I don't return Marilyn's letters unread and unopened. I know I cannot completely understand the depth of your unhappiness, but I want to be your friend. Please feel free to contact me whenever you need to talk. Perhaps if you gave me your daughter's name and address, I could write to her and pass along the news to you. Here's my address and phone number. Thank you for your concern, but uh, I'm sure Jehovah will make me strong. And I have all the friends I need in the organization. Oh, hello, Beverly. I was out in the service in the neighborhood, but I was having trouble presenting these magazines on the happy family life. It just upset me when we're so unhappy. I hope you don't mind that I came to talk to you instead. 
You see, I can still count my time if you'll agree to have a Bible discussion with me. Of course, I'll be happy to discuss the Bible with you. Come on in, I'll make us some tea. Would it be all right if you showed me the scriptures your organization uses for disfellowshipping people? I don't really understand your disfellowshipping practices. Could this be our Bible study today? Well, we don't usually share those scriptures with the public, but I do have my Bible marked since we went through this so recently. First of all, in each of our congregations, we have a committee made up of three mature men who discipline the people. When a person sins and appears before the committee, they are corrected by the committee. You were given six months to give up smoking. You said you had. And yet, you were caught smoking in your truck by an informant loyal to Jehovah's organization. You are therefore disfellowshipped, and from now on, no one will speak to you for months. If you don't attend all meetings and show your repentance and stop smoking, you will lose your eternal life at Armageddon. It sounds like this committee has a lot of power over your people. Yes. Depending on how serious the sin is, some are disciplined privately and must prove repentance to the committee. Some are put on probation for a period of time if they show good attitude. However, if a person chooses to disregard the instructions of the committee or they are rebellious to Jehovah's organization, they are expelled or disfellowshipped. My daughter Marilyn is an example of a rebellious one. She was told not to date anyone except Jehovah's Witnesses. Although in her defense, there are so few eligible men in our organization. The young man that she dated, Tom, he was a nice young man, honest, clean living, but he wouldn't become a Jehovah's Witness. No matter how nice her young man was, if he was not a Jehovah's Witness, he would be considered wrong for her? Yes. When Marilyn married Tom, she was put on probation. His parents put on a small wedding, but we couldn't go because they rented a church hall. Also, Tom serves in the military, which is forbidden by our organization. Our daughter lives on a military base, and she went to work on the base. At that point, she was disfellowshipped for her outright rebellion. Now she's dead to us. Well, this is all very interesting. But could you give me Bible reasons for this disfellowshipping practice? Where in the Bible do three men sit in judgment over the congregation? Well, there's no actual scripture about three men forming a committee that I know of, but, well, the Bible does speak of elders guiding the believers and disciplining them. Then I guess we'll have to examine those scriptures and see how the Bible elders acted and see if your committee acts the same way. I guess so, but first let me show you the scriptures we use for disowning disfellowship ones like Marilyn. Turn with me, if you will, to 1 Corinthians 5, 11. I'm writing to you to quit mixing in company with anyone called a brother that is a fornicator or a greedy person or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or an extortioner. Now, verse 13 plainly says, remove the wicked man from among yourselves. I'm sorry, Martha, but I don't see the connection to Marilyn's being disfellowshipped. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 deals with a specific problem. According to verse 1, a man was committing adultery with his father's wife. Mm -hmm. The congregation, according to verse 2, was tolerating this sin. Paul said to quit mixing in company with a believer that is a fornicator. Is Marilyn a fornicator? No, she wasn't found guilty of fornication or of sexual relations outside of marriage but of only marrying out of her faith and taking a job forbidden by our organization. I agree that marrying out of one's faith may not be a good idea, and I mean her job may not suit your organization, but where is this a disfellowshipping offense? I don't know, but I'll go home and do further research on that. Also, could you really consider Marilyn guilty of one of the other things mentioned here? Is she really covetous? An idolater, a reviler, a drunkard, or a swindler? No, of course not. She's a good person. Well, since this scripture doesn't apply to Marilyn, do you have another? Well, let's see. We also use 2 Thessalonians 3.14. Um, if anyone is not obedient to our word through this letter, keep this one marked. Stop associating with him that he might become ashamed. But Martha, 
This chapter is dealing with evil and perverse men, according to verse 2. Verse 6 here refers to men who lead an unruly life. Now, is Marilyn perverse and evil? Does she lead an unruly life? No, of course not. She's a good wife. Then why are you all treating her so badly? The very next verse, verse 15 here says, And yet do not regard him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Marilyn is being treated as an enemy. And how can you admonish her as a sister when you're not allowed to speak to her? I, I don't know, Bev. All I know is that I can't speak to her on orders of the committee. Well, I'm sorry, Martha, but I just can't see from the Bible why Marilyn was disfellowshipped. Also, military people were Christians in Christ's day. What about Cornelius? He was a military man and greatly blessed of God. Um, I, listen, I have to go home now, Bev. Goodbye. Well, bye. <sighs> Look, Leo, we have been at this for hours. We've gone over all the scriptures that society uses for disfellowshipping. And you haven't convinced me at all that Marilyn should have been disfellowshipped. And you know it. I'm going to bed. We've noticed a tendency on your part to be a bit rebellious to Jehovah's organization. You should not have invited Brother Ralph to go with you on another call to Mrs. Williams after I told you we would not be going back. Now, Brother Ralph confirms that everything she said to you was right out of Christendom. We want your word now that you will never go back to her house. And if you do, you will face disciplinary action by this committee and possible disfellowshipping. You would not want to spend the rest of the time remaining before Armageddon to be cut off from all of us with no one to speak to and facing Jehovah's destruction. You have brought reproach on Jehovah's organization. You have kept your pregnancy a secret now for three months from the committee. This shows no attitude of repentance on your part. The concerned sister turned you in. We have therefore disfellowshipped you. We uh, fully realize that you have no money and that your married boyfriend now wants nothing more to do with you. Please, please help me. I know where to turn to. We suggest you go to the welfare office and have them look after you. If you accept your discipline and show your repentance, then perhaps you can be reinstated sometime in the future, uh, depending on your conduct. You'd better hope that Armageddon doesn't come in the meantime. All right, let's review our plan one more time. We must act tonight, since your baby will receive a court-ordered blood transfusion tomorrow and become a ward of the court. Now, are we prepared to obey Jehovah rather than the law? Yes. All right, a phone call will be made to the nurse in the nursery in exactly two minutes. She will leave the nursery unattended, since she has to go to the station in order to receive the call. A faithful sister will keep her on the phone just as long as possible. Sister Beagle, you're to keep both nurses occupied at the station while brother and sister Small go to the nursery, take the baby, and leave. You can count on me, Brother Stern. I'll keep them talking for plenty of time to save that poor baby from them. Loyalty to Jehovah's organization is the most important thing. I am prepared to go to jail, if need be, to stop that blood transfusion. Oh, never mind the dramatic, Sister Beagle. Just get on with the job. Brother and Sister Small, there'll be no time for hesitancy once you get inside the nursery. I'm going to get the van now. I'll meet you at the appointed spot with a motor running and the door open. May Jehovah help us all. Hello, I'm 
I've just arrived and I would like to see my sister immediately, please. May I ask They called me last night and told me she would probably have to have an emergency cesarean section, I believe it was. I'm just so worried. I wonder if I might go to her room right away. Could I do that, please? She was in a great deal of pain and I had driven all night long to get here through awful weather and dreadful traffic. Laura, can we help you? farm in the next jurisdiction. We've also got some other safe locations to take you to, just in case the need arises. Brother Stern! Brother Stern! Our baby! He's hardly breathing! He looks so sick! You've got to help us, Brother Stern! Get us to a hospital fast! We've come too far to go back. I'll take you to emergency in the next town. Oh, God! What have we done to our baby? Oh, hurry, Brother Stern! Hurry! Last night was probably the worst night I have ever spent in my life. I have been going over and over the disfellowshipping procedures and rules of the society, trying to line them up with scripture. Mm. And I admit that I'm ashamed for some of the other things I've done, too. I'm ashamed of myself, too, Leo, for the way I've treated the disfellowshipped ones. The small's baby nearly died last year. He still has medical problems because we took him out of the hospital. I've never questioned the society before, but now Marilyn is involved. I've tried to be strong to encourage you, Martha, but now I'm, I'm worried about Marilyn. Have we been treating her wrongly? Have we made a big mistake? Oh, Leo, it's so good to see you softening in your heart to her. This is probably a good time to confess that Beverly Williams has been writing to Marilyn and passing the news on to me. Now, Leo, I couldn't have taken it otherwise. Bev Williams has been a good friend to me, and she does know her Bible. That woman's done nothing but annoy me. First she took Joe Simpson away from me, and now you're involved with her. Did she really take Joe away from you, or just away from the organization? Didn't you cut yourself off from Joe? <laughs> he still misses you, according to Bev. <laughs> Leo, I, I want this matter settled one way or another. Either prove Bev Williams wrong from the Bible, or I will continue to be her friend. All right, you win. This time, tell her that we're coming over for a Bible discussion. But I get to pick the subject this time. I could never get the best of her on that discussion that Joe and I had with her about Jesus being the Archangel Michael. I could never prove that Jesus was Michael firmly from Scripture. But this time, we'll discuss our earthly hope. Uh, I'm on real good ground on that one. She won't be so sure she's going to heaven when I get through with her. I want to prove to you from Scripture, Mrs. Williams, that you should be trusting in an earthly hope, not a heavenly one. Now, actually, only a small number of chosen ones, anointed ones, go to heaven. And the rest of mankind can only hope to live on the earth. Now, the Bible limits the number of those who go to heaven to 144,000. The rest of the believers, the great crowd, remain on a cleansed earth. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 7, and I'll show you. Uh, just a moment. Before we begin reading this chapter of Revelation, could I have a decision from you both? 
Are we going to read this portion of scripture with the understanding that it is figurative? That is, it says one thing but actually has another meaning? Or are we going to believe it literally? That is, it means exactly what it says and nothing else. What? Well, I assume you're going to begin by reading verse 4, which says, And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. So how about it, folks? Figurative or literal? Figurative. Literal. Uh, well, I, mean, I meant uh, literal. I can see your problem, both of you. You see, your organization has taken this one simple sentence from the Bible and given the number 144,000 a literal interpretation. Well, it is literal. I mean, 144,000 means exactly what it says, 144,000. But then it has turned right around and given the phrase sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel a figurative interpretation saying it's not really Israel but spiritual Israel or anointed Jehovah's Witnesses. It is figurative. Anointed Jehovah's Witnesses are the spiritual Israelites referred to here. No, Leo. That is not possible. Either we interpret this scripture figuratively in which case, a large number of persons symbolized by the figure 144,000 who are not actually physical Israelites but spiritual ones are sealed. Or, 144,000 actual Israelites by nationality are sealed. Now, which is it? Well, uh, I want a little more time to study this and uh, then I'll come back to you with the answer. Now let's get on to the subject of the great crowd that will stay on earth. Uh, now turn with me to verse 9. After these things I saw and looked a great crowd which no man was able to number out of all nations and tribes and peoples and tongues standing before the throne and before the Lamb. Notice this great crowd comes out of all nations. This great crowd is the modern day Jehovah's Witnesses who will remain on the paradise earth. Well, that's an interesting interpretation, Leo. So you locate this great crowd on earth, do you? Yes, of course. Well, the scripture does give their location, doesn't it? It says they're before the throne and before the Lamb, right? Right. Well, if we just continue reading on in this same chapter, we find that this is a heavenly scene and not an earthly one at all. Notice in verse 11, the angels were standing around the throne and along with others fell on their faces before the throne. Before the throne can also mean the earth. The earth is Jehovah's footstool. That's an interesting point. Uh, however, if I understand your doctrine correctly, you place the 144,000 in heaven and the great crowd on earth, right? Right. Well, then let's look at the other scripture that mentions the 144,000. Revelation chapter 14 and verse 1 again mentions the 144,000. Verse 3 says they're singing a new song. Where is this song being sung? <sighs> It says the 144,000 are before the throne. <laughs> Leo, that's the same place as the great crowd. That's right, Martha. All scriptures referring to both the 144,000 and the great crowd place them in the same location before the throne. Well, I, I want to do some further research on this. The organization has all the answers. I know you believe that, Leo, but the Bible should be our final authority in all doctrinal matters. Even the organization has to line up with the Bible. You see, Leo and Martha, it isn't where you'll spend eternity that's so important, but it's who you'll spend eternity with. Turn with me to John chapter 14 and verse 3. Here Jesus promises his followers... And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Down in verse 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Now, frankly, it disturbs me 
to hear you and Martha refer to your organization as the truth, when it is Jesus Christ himself who is the truth. Leo, she's right. We do call our organization the truth more than we call Jesus the truth. You see, it is Jesus who has prepared a place for us. And wherever he is, we can be also. If he is in heaven, I'll be in heaven. If he is on the new earth, I'll be on the new earth. If he is in the air, then I'll meet him in the air. Jesus has gone to prepare a place for me. But you know, the place is not important. Being with Jesus is important. I want to thank you for taking the time this week to drop off your booklet explaining Jehovah's Witnesses' stand against taking blood transfusions. If I understand it correctly, Jehovah's Witnesses take all the scriptures referring to the eating of blood and regard the transfusing of blood the same. Is this right? Mm -hmm. That's right. We regard the transfusing of blood the same as eating of blood. Jehovah God forbids us to use blood or blood products in any way. We are to abstain from blood, as the Bible tells us. What is the penalty if a Jehovah's Witness should use blood in some way? It's a very serious offense. Use of blood results in one being cut off from Jehovah's organization. Not only is the user disfellowshipped, he loses his eternal life. I see your organization leans very heavily on Leviticus chapter 17 for its stand. Mm -hmm. Verse 14 seems to be a favorite, so let's read that together. For as for the life of all flesh, its blood is identified with its life. Therefore I said to the sons of Israel, you are not to eat the blood of any flesh, for the life of all flesh is its blood. Whoever eats it shall be cut off. Yes, Bev, that's just the point. You see, eating blood and transfusing blood are the same. And so if you eat blood, you are cut off. I mean, it says it right there in the Bible. But what does cut off mean? Well, it means loss of eternal life. Does it mean loss of eternal life, as your organization teaches, or something much less severe? Let's read on to verses 15 and 16. And when any person eats an animal which dies, or is torn by beasts, whether he is a native or an alien, he shall wash his clothes and bathe in water, and remain unclean until evening. Then he'll become clean. Are you telling me that the penalty for eating blood is just to bathe and wash your clothes? Offenders were only cut off until sundown? That's right, Martha. The law on eating blood applied only to the natural Israelites and those living with them. If a person ate blood, it invoked only the mildest penalty under the law. Nowhere in scripture can I find the harsh judgments handed out by your organization. I have to look into this matter further. I mean, I haven't spoken to a childhood friend for 10 years because she took a blood transfusion during an operation. I, I have believed all these years that she committed the most serious of sins against Jehovah. Well, actually, I have another reason for bringing this to your attention. I have another letter here from Marilyn in which she says there may be some blood incompatibilities with the new baby. <gasps> now, don't worry. No transfusions may be required, but I want you and Leo to be prepared just in case. Please take this letter now and also my notes in which I go through this booklet point by point and bring out other scriptures you might like to look at. Mm. Well, so Leo and I spent many hours going over the scriptures on blood with the society's literature and your notes. And we agree that although Jehovah God does not like his people eating blood, neither did he punish them excessively for doing so, but he forgave them. I'm so pleased to hear you say that, Martha. Also, we agreed with you that the New Testament references on abstaining from blood had to do with murder or eating food strangled and offered to idols. We have just never read scriptures alone without the society's interpretations. Well, the Bible can be understood by itself, and I'm happy you and Leo are finding that out for yourselves. We're still worried sick over Marilyn and the expected baby, but at least now we no longer view the blood issue with the same severity. 
We hope that neither one of them will require a blood transfusion, but if they need it to save their lives, at least now we realize that God can forgive them. By the way, Leo and I still feel that Jehovah God must deal with his people through some organization, and although ours may be far from perfect, it's still better than anything else around. Leo wants some proof from you as to why you feel our organization cannot be used by God. Could you come over Wednesday evening and talk this over with us? I'm so pleased you invited me over. I'm loaded down with photocopies, which I plan to leave with you, so you can just examine them at your leisure. We don't need any apostate literature from you. Leo, all are photocopies of your society's own literature in which they have falsely prophesied the end of the world for over 100 years. The Watchtower Society claims in its literature that they are the prophet of God and even that all of their followers are prophets of God because they proclaim the same message. That's right, Leo. Remember in our Watchtower study, it said that we were prophets too because we proclaimed the message of the society. When you examine the society's record of prophecies, please keep in mind this scripture in Deuteronomy 18.22. When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not come about or come true, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You shall not be afraid of him. In fact, in the days of Israel, False prophets whose predictions did not come to pass were taken outside the city gates and rocked to sleep. These photocopies have just got to be phonies. Oh. I'm going to the Kingdom Hall Library and check these out. What, now? Yes, are you coming? Uh, yes. Uh... Bring a flashlight. I don't want anyone to catch us, so I'm not turning the lights on. Oh, Martha, Martha. Oh, here's one I want to check. According to this hate literature, as late as 1929, the society was still saying Christ was present since 1874. This book, Prophecy, is copyrighted 1929. At mm -hmm. least that's correct. We both know the correct date is 1914. The society couldn't be wrong about something as important as that. I mean, all our hopes for the new earth are based on 1914. The second presence of Christ began in 1914. Wait, here's the page, number... 65. Uh -huh. It says, the scriptural proof is that the second presence of the Lord Jesus Christ began in 1874 A.D. Huh? Okay, look, here is the time is at hand. Leo, 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 Leo. Okay. You can see the society really did see that the Battle of Armageddon had already started and would end in 1915. Oh, I just can't believe that one, that the society would be that far out. <gasps> Page 101, Leo. The Battle of the Great Day of God Almighty, which will end in A.D. 1915, oh. with the complete overthrow of Earth's present rulership, is already commenced. Oh, I've seen enough, Martha. Oh, Leo. <laughs> These photocopies are real. I feel sick. Let's go home. Wait a minute. I hear something. Now, normally I'm not out this late, but loyalty to Jehovah's organization compelled me to pound on your door until you woke up to check this out. Quick, hide behind the door. Look, Sister Beagle, there's no sign of a break-in, and who would want anything we've got in the basement of Kingdom Hall anyway? Brother, how can you say such a thing? Jehovah's truths are right down here in this library. Our precious old books are unsafe. They wouldn't be here at all if you elders had sent them into headquarters as you were supposed to. At least Bethel headquarters wants to protect our books from, from thieves and fire. Why, they might be in real danger right now. If there were thieves here now, I'm sure your voice has scared them away. Besides, my nephew down at Bethel headquarters told me that they destroyed all the old books sent to them. I often wondered why. I think we know why. Now, will you let me get back to my bed if I show you that no one is here? Well, 
everything seems to be in order. I wonder what those lights were. Well, anyway, one cannot be too careful in protecting Jehovah's organization. Well, Sister Vigil. Jehovah's organization will be safe now until morning, thanks to you. prophecies and then Sister Beagle. How much can one man endure in one night? Leo, I have something else to confess to you. Several months ago I received this in the mail. It's a letter saying that a Christian is praying for us and sent our names into this ministry. That should have gone to the committee. Leo, we were invited to check out several things about our religion. I knew you'd be furious, but I did read it. It said that our dating system was an error. Leo, I couldn't believe that Jerusalem didn't fall in, in 607 BCE as our society has always taught us. Of course Jerusalem fell in 607. What do you mean? Leo, I went to the library and I spent all day looking through encyclopedias and history books with the help of the librarian. Leo, not one historian, not one agreed with the date that the society said of 607. Leo, if 607 is wrong, then 1914 is wrong. And our hope of being the last generation is also wrong. Leo, we weren't supposed to discuss 1975, but we both know that the society set that date and it failed too. Martha, we've lived our whole lives for the Watchtower Society. We never intended to have children just to please the society. Having Marilyn was an accident. Thank God we have her. Many of the older ones don't have any family, and now it's too late. Leo, you're a natural leader. For years, I've watched you take menial jobs with low wages just so you could make time to serve Jehovah's organization. Yes. Now I have no pension plan or medical coverage just because I believed that Armageddon was going to be here any moment. And don't forget what little savings we had we gave to the society in 1975. Thank God we didn't remortgage our home as so many did. Martha, I can no longer believe that we are in God's organization. Whatever will we do? We ended the most horrible night of our lives agreeing that we have been serving a false organization. We have never been in such despair in our whole lives, and yet we still love God and want to serve Him. I'm so happy to hear you say that, Martha. You know, some people become disenchanted with the organization, and they turn completely away from God. Others drift in a no-man's land for many years, and they miss the greatest chance for happiness that they could have. <laughs> you mean there could be happiness in our lives after all these wasted years? Of course. There are even a couple of scriptures that describe you and Leo, I believe. Uh, look here in John chapter 5 and verses 39 and 40. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life and it is these that bear witness of me and you are unwilling to come to me that you might have life martha you and leo have spent your whole life searching the scriptures but missing a personal relationship with christ but bev in my bible in john 17 3 it says this means everlasting life. They're taking in knowledge of you, the only true God, and of the one whom you sent forth, Jesus Christ. I mean, that's why we spend so much time taking in knowledge. It means our eternal life. I'm sorry to tell you this, Martha, but 
That scripture has been altered by your translation committee. The words taking in knowledge do not even appear in the original Greek text. You can check this out in your Kingdom Interlinear translation. Oh, you can be sure I will. I've been checking out a lot of things these days. Here's what that scripture really says. Listen closely. And this is eternal life, that they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Oh, that talks about knowing God, not taking in knowledge. You're right, Martha. You see, eternal life comes from knowing God, not taking in knowledge. You just can't work your way to God, not by meeting attendance, service, or study. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, puts it this way. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, that no man should boast. I have been so busy all these years trying to do works and prove my faithfulness to Jehovah. Martha, you just don't need any more works. But you do need this free gift of God. You need to know God. Why don't you pray and ask God to come into your life right now to help you through this difficult time? You know, I do need this gift from God. Bev, will you take my hand while I pray? Of course I will. Dear God, you know I love you. <laughs> and I have served you to the best of my understanding all my life. And now my life is upside down. I have been in a false organization, and I ask you to forgive me. I want to know Jesus, and I want eternal life. Oh, Jesus, please help me. Come into my life and be my savior. Help me to sort out truth from error. I know now that I'm, I'm saved by grace and that alone. Thank you. Amen. <laughs> Is it okay if I give my new sister in Christ a big welcome hug into the family of God? <laughs> Joe, Leo. Well, uh, I'm, I'm happy to see you again. I've really missed you. Hey, Joe, uh, I've got to talk to you, but uh, where we can't be seen, can you drive outside town where we used to meet for coffee so we could talk uh, in private? Yeah, yeah, sure, Leo. Uh, Good. I'm on a break. Um, do you know I've even got a thermos of coffee in the car? Yeah. Uh, I'll leave right now? Good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Hello there. Apostate. Oh, <laughs> uh, Sister Beagle, uh, how, how, how long have you been here? I just got here. That apostate, Joe Simpson, tried to speak to me on the way into the store. Did he try to talk to you too, Brother Stern? No, I, uh, I can't stop now. I, I, uh, I've got another appointment. But I... I, I... As you know, Leo, Nicodemus, like yourself, was a very devout religious man, a, a leader among his people. Yet notice in verse 3 that Jesus told him that unless he was born again, he wouldn't see the kingdom of God. Again in verse 5, Jesus told him that without this experience, he wouldn't enter into the kingdom of God. And verse 7 sums it all up by saying, Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. But, Joe, I've been pinning all my hopes on the new earth. Leo, do you or do you not want to spend eternity in the kingdom of God, whether in heaven or on earth? Yes, I want to spend eternity in God's kingdom. Then Jesus said you must be born again. <laughs> Never mind the location, Leo. The location isn't important. Being born again, that's what's important. 
But isn't that an experience for the anointed ones, the 144,000? Nowhere in the Bible does it limit the number that can have this experience. Look here in John uh, 1, 12, 13. It says, but as many as received him. Notice, Leo. As many as received him, not just 144,000. To them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. Well, it does say, as many as received him. Leo, even in my worst time of confusion about Jesus, I remember how I, I cried out to him and I received him as my savior. And I well remember I didn't have all the answers, only questions. And yet I trusted in him, not some organization. I gotta get back to work now, but uh, I know you love Jesus. And we wanna trust him also. Please keep in touch. I'll be praying for you and Martha. Thank you, Joe. Dear God, I don't know how to pray this kind of prayer. Jehovah, through Jesus, please help me. I have been like Nicodemus, harsh and righteous, and yet I feel empty. Dear Jesus, I want to know you like Joe does, like a friend. Please forgive me for all the years I've spent serving a false organization, believing I was serving you. I want to be born again and live in God's kingdom. I want to be with you, God, either in heaven or on earth, wherever. I receive you as my savior. Please come into my heart and my mind and help me to serve you from now on. Amen. Where have you been, Leo? Oh, around. Where are you out to? Where did you go? Oh, I went to Beth's place. I uh, ran into Joe. We had a little talk. Bev and I had a little talk, too. I asked Christ to be my savior today, Leo, and I feel so much better. I did the same thing, and I feel better, too. <laughs> okay. I think we've made some progress now in your disassociation letter. Are these the points you and Martha want to cover? Mm, yes, this is good. Number one, all the lies the society has told over the years to cover up their false prophecies and doctrinal changes. Number two... The unscriptural position they take over disfellowshipping and the unkindness they show their victims. I can testify to that one firsthand. Number three, their false interpretation of unrelated scriptures regarding blood transfusions, resulting in the loss of many lives. Number four, they're keeping their members from a personal relationship with Jesus Christ by inserting the organization as their mediator. You just can't serve Jesus and the organization. Yeah. You know, I'm also going to add a number five, Joe. Since I've had a chance to go over their instructions to elders assisting child custody cases, you know, it amounts to teaching witness children to lie under oath. I can't leave without exposing their tactics. Joe, how did Martha and I ever believe that this organization was of God? I can imagine how you feel, Leo. I gave a year or so to this society, and you and Martha gave most of your lives. The organization keeps you so busy, you don't have time to think for yourself. 
We've been on a treadmill of constant activity for years. I'm going to put a lot more effort into my disassociation letter, Joe. Oh, yours was good, but you didn't provide enough uh, photocopies. <laughs> Mine is going to be the thickest they have ever seen. <laughs> And then when it's through, Martha and I are going to go to Maryland's where we can be there just in time for the birth of our grandchild. I couldn't be happier for all of you. All this is an answer to my prayers. I uh, hand delivered our letter of disassociation from the Watchtower Society yesterday. Oh, you did? And after that, Martha and I went out for a big celebration dinner. <laughs> yeah, we're so thankful we came out together and still have each other. And we know that the Lord will give us new friends to make up for the ones we know are going to forsake us. Yeah, by the way, I gave a copy of the letter to Sister Beagle. Oh. <laughs> she likes to be the first one to spread the hot gossip. You no, know, we thank God for you, Bev and Joe, our first yeah. Christian friends. You've opened our eyes. Well, we're off on the first relaxing trip of our lives. Oh, yes. <laughs> All our other vacations have been spent working at the society's conventions. <laughs> and at the end of our trip, we're going to have a reunion with Marilyn and Tom. <laughs> We've never been so happy. Oh, I think all those years serving a false organization. I just thank God it's not too late to make amends, spend the rest of our lives serving the Lord. <laughs> Have a wonderful trip. Yeah. Good. Thank you. I'm happy everything. for you. Have a great time. Thank you. Bunch of apostates. What is happening here may be unique in American history. The marches you see are not protesting unfair labor practices or advocating a political cause. They are here to challenge the conscience of the wealthy and powerful Watchtower Society, better known to the public as Jehovah's Witnesses. Jehovah's Witnesses have a massive international organization with millions of members and hundreds of millions of dollars. A gift that God gave to the human race. Amen, brother. Families and peace. But this deeply committed group is not likely to be intimidated. They have an urgent message to deliver. You can't see the hurt that we feel, but we have we have so much pain because so many of us are separated from our families because of the of the Watchtower organization's rules. Unfair, unkind, unloving, unchristian rules. The organization sets itself up in the place of Christ, and that is something that the Bible does not teach. The reason we are here today is to attract attention to a genuine false prophet, a genuine false prophet that Jesus warned us about. They have lied to us, they have deceived us, and we have the documented evidence. greatest dream, paradise. Surely all of us are thrilled at the prospect of surviving the end of this wicked world and living on into God's righteous new order. What a grand future awaits us.
This confidence statement, brimming with hope, is from the Watchtower Society's publication, You Can Live Forever in Paradise on Earth. It is this promise that attracts the new convert to become a Jehovah's Witness. The thing that attracted me to the Watchtower Society was that they taught that Armageddon was so close that those uh, who were living now would never have to die, but that they could live forever. I think one of the greatest uh, things that appeals to the people is that uh, we are taught, that we were taught, that uh, we could live forever here on the earth, and there would be peace, perfect peace, among men and animals. The little children could play with the animals, and uh, there would be no harm or no hurt in all of the earth. Jehovah's Witnesses came along with a positive message, I thought, from the Bible. God had a plan and purpose for Martin Merriman, and that is what I wanted, to please God. Martin Merriman was not alone on the Jehovah's Witness road. Statistics show that in the 22-year period between 1963 and 1985, the Jehovah's Witness organization grew from one million members to three million. Jehovah's Witness spokesman Eugene Mortensen. The increase the Jehovah's Witnesses are experiencing right now is phenomenal. Last year, for an example, worldwide, we had a 6.8% increase. It all began in Pennsylvania in the late 1800s when Charles Taze Russell came under the influence of a second Adventist preacher. Russell initiated his own Bible study class, a small group that would ultimately grow to become the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. Borrowing directly from the prophetic speculations of Nelson Barber, a New York second Adventist, Russell claimed that in 1799, the world had entered the time of the end. That in 1874, Jesus Christ had returned invisibly, and that the world would come to an end in the year 1914. In 1879, Russell, then 27 years of age, was so passionately convinced these prophetic dates were given by God, that he sold his prosperous clothing business and struck out in a new direction. With very little education or theological background, he began printing the magazine Zion's Watchtower and Herald of Christ's Presence. Known today as the Watchtower, this publication, which has grown from an initial printing of 6,000 to well over 288 million copies annually, dictates all major doctrines to Jehovah's Witnesses. During his lifetime, Russell authored a vast amount of literature, including a series of volumes entitled Studies in the Scriptures. According to Russell, no one could understand the Bible without these books, and reading the Bible alone would lead only to spiritual darkness. One of Russell's teachings was that Egypt's Great Pyramid was designed and placed there by God as his second witness next to the Bible. It would be an instrument to reveal his great plan of the ages for mankind. This measurement indicates the length of the year, the weight of the earth, the distance to the sun, etc. Russell believed his dates and chronology were confirmed by the measurements of the interior passageways of the Great Pyramid. According to Russell, the passageways verified 1914 as the year the world would end. Finally, 1914 came and went. Russell and his followers were not raptured from the earth, and the end had not come. John Knight, who was 15 years old at the time, remembers what came next. Well, when 1914 came, of course, uh, we had to change our views, just like we had to change the views later. The date was pushed forward to 1915. Then, 1918. Certainly Armageddon was just around the corner. But in 1916, Charles Taze Russell died, sick, weary, and disappointed. A massive stone pyramid stands today at his gravesite as an embarrassing reminder of his false prophecies.
Through hard-fisted inside political manipulation, Joseph Franklin Rutherford, a Missouri lawyer who had given himself the title of judge, became the second president of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society in 1917. In 1918, Judge Rutherford's lecture, entitled Millions Now Living Will Never Die, was the beginning of a worldwide recruiting effort called the Millions Campaign. Not too surprisingly, it proclaimed the coming destruction of the existing world. It would happen soon, in 1925. Based upon the promises set forth in the divine word, we must reach the positive and indisputable conclusion that millions now living will never die. In 1920, the Millions Book was published. In it, Rutherford claimed the Bible proved that in 1925, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and other faithful men of old were to be resurrected, to rule henceforth as princes on the new Paradise Earth. Fully convinced that Rutherford's prophecy was true, many witnesses sold their homes and businesses and took to the road. Living in cars and trucks like itinerant peddlers, they spread the warning. As 1925 drew closer, some farmers even refused to plant crops because they believed the end was at hand. Finally, 1925 came. And, as in 1914, nothing happened. Once again, the Watchtower Society's prophecy had proven false. As Russell had done, Rutherford doggedly held to the story that the end was just around the corner. In 1929, the judge had this palatial mansion constructed. It was deeded to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, so they and other ancient worthies would have a place to live when they were resurrected. Located in an exclusive district of San Diego, it was given the name Beth Sarim, Hebrew for House of the Princes. The world entered the Great Depression, but Rutherford lived like a millionaire spending the winter months at Beth Serene, summering in Europe. As Americans suffered through poverty and deprivation, Rutherford enjoyed the use of two 16-cylinder Cadillacs. Under Rutherford, the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society became a well-oiled corporation. New books, literature, and tracts poured forth in a flood to be sold door-to-door -door by faithful witnesses. He drove his followers to labor hard for the Lord. He advised young couples not to marry, but to put all their energies into proclaiming the kingdom. Even portable phonographs were utilized at the doorstep. Because the people have been induced to believe that Christianity and religion are the same thing. Around the world, zealous witnesses paraded in front of churches on Sunday mornings bearing placards with the slogan, Religion is a snare and a racket. <coughs> Keeping up with the times, the society constructed its own radio station. And by 1933, there were 403 stations nationwide broadcasting Rutherford's abusive railings against the clergy, politicians, and what he referred to as the greedy commercialists. On the radio and in print, he continually stressed that the end of the world was just months away. The end finally came, but only for Rutherford. In 1942, he died at Beth Serene, the house he had built as a luxurious testimony to God's name. In retrospect, perhaps the only testimony this lovely mansion ever gave was to the cash value of false prophecy. In 1948, the society quietly sold the property, covering up an embarrassing chapter in its history. Today, most modern Jehovah's Witnesses are unaware that Beth Sarim ever existed. There is not one religious With Rutherford's passing, the flamboyant era of charismatic personalities passed as well. Today, 
fueled by the anxieties of a nuclear age, the Watchtower Society is a multinational corporate giant, spreading its new message of doom to every corner of the globe. Standing between God and the millions of Jehovah's Witnesses is an autocratic ruling council called the Governing Body. Because Jehovah's Witnesses believe the Word of God is channeled to humanity through this elite committee alone, these men rule with unchallenged authority. Every witness is subject to their dictatorship, from the cradle to the grave. Raymond Franz, author of the book Crisis of Conscience, was a member of the Watchtower Society's governing body for nine of his 60 years as a Jehovah's Witness. His account of their secret sessions is revealing. I must say that it was one of the most disillusioning experiences of my life. Uh, it came as a, a rude awakening to me to see what actually went on. I envisioned the governing body as a body of men to whom the, the Bible, God's Word, was the controlling force in every one of their decisions who really dug into the scriptures to make sure that everything that they did was soundly based upon the Bible. And when I got into the governing body, I found that the Bible was rarely appealed to, was rarely used, that mainly was a matter of discussing organizational policy and how to apply this organizational policy. And I found that again and again, when issues came up, even though scriptures might pre be presented, if there was an organizational policy, that policy would take precedence over scripture. And I couldn't help but think of Jesus' words in Matthew 23, that they have made the word of God null and void because of their tradition. While the organization may not always consult scripture in determining policy, they never hesitate to cite scripture as proof of their authority. The Watchtower Society claims that it is the faithful and wise servant, or as Jehovah's Witnesses have translated it, the faithful and discreet slave spoken of in Matthew 24. Leonard and Marjorie Cretian are authors of the book Witnesses of Jehovah. For 22 years they were loyal Jehovah's Witnesses. Leonard had risen to the position of elder and presiding overseer. The original belief was that Charles Taze Russell was the chosen slave. The Watchtower Society taught that the stewardship of the things of God had been taken away from the Christian churches and given to Russell. When Russell died, they had to adjust their belief to fit a new set of facts. Now they claim that in 1919, having invisibly come into power over the earth, Christ needed an organization to announce his kingdom and administer his affairs here. So the story goes, he carefully examined all the Christian religions and rejected them in favor of the Watchtower Society. Peter Gregerson was a member of the Watchtower Society for nearly 50 years. He was a highly respected elder and served in a number of responsible positions. And as a result, I started to do some very serious thinking about things that were going on inside the organization. It seemed to me, though, that everything always came back to the question, is the Watchtower Society and its leadership, are they the faithful slave? I really wanted to prove to myself that the Watchtower Society was right. Gregerson decided to examine the same teachings that Christ would have examined in 1919 when he was supposedly evaluating the world's religious organizations. The Watchtower's latest teachings at that time were published in a book called The Finished Mystery. What I found absolutely destroyed my confidence in the Watchtower. They had said that the end of the world would come in 1914. And in this book that was just hot off the presses for Christ to investigate, we're saying that by the spring of 1918, millions of people would be dying in the streets throughout the world. It, it wasn't happening in 1918. Christ was supposedly examining this written material to see whether the Watchtower Society should be put in charge of all of God's interests on the earth, and they were guilty of the worst kind of false prophecy. In addition to false prophecy, the Finnish mystery contained a number of other pretty ludicrous interpretations of Scripture. According to them, Revelation 12 clearly shows that Michael and his angels are the Pope of Rome and his bishops. Revelation 14 mentions a distance of 1,600 furlongs, 
which this fascinating book explains is the distance from Scranton, Pennsylvania, to Watchtower headquarters in Brooklyn, provided you go by way of the Hoboken Ferry and the Lackawanna Railroad. The Bible speaks of the great sea monster Leviathan. You may want to know what the Leviathan really looked like. The finished mystery told Jehovah's Witnesses that the Leviathan was a steam locomotive and this little coupling link was its tongue. This book, the Watchtower's main teaching book of the time, included a prediction that in 1918 demons would invade the minds of the Christian church which they refer to as the swine class. We wish every Jehovah's Witness today could read the finished mystery for themselves. They would probably reach the same conclusion Peter Gregerson did. I spent a lot of time praying a lot of time thinking, came to the conclusion there was no possible way that Christ Jesus as a judge could have looked at this information and have given the authority that was claimed by the Watchtower Society. Still, Jehovah's Witnesses maintain that theirs is the only true religion. All others constitute the worldwide empire of false religion, the whore of Babylon spoken of in the book of Revelation. The Watchtower says these religions are guilty of spiritual fornication with the political and commercial rulers of the world and will all be slaughtered by God at Armageddon. Only the true Christians, Jehovah's Witnesses, will survive. F.M. Geip, a Watchtower spokesman and member of the headquarters staff, explains. Well, we feel Jehovah's Witnesses are the only true religion, otherwise we would be teaching something else. But the reason is because we follow the Bible completely. To support its beliefs, the Watchtower organization has published its own version of the Bible called the New World Translation. To lend credence to this translation, the Watchtower Society has deliberately misquoted a number of well-known Greek scholars. Dr. J. R. Manti, an eminent Greek scholar, was one of the authorities quoted out of context. The Watchtower Society has implied that he supports their New World Translation. Dr. Manti disagrees. I have never found any so-called translation that goes so far away from what the scripture actually teaches as these books published by Jehovah's Witnesses. They are so far away from what there is in the original Hebrew and the original Greek. Dr. Manti called the Jehovah's Witness Bible a shocking mistranslation, obsolete and incorrect. You can't follow there's because it's uh, biased and uh, it's deceptive because they deliberately changed words in a passage of scripture to make it fit into their doctrine. They distorted the scripture in many passages, scores and scores of passages in the New Testament dealing with the deity of Christ especially to find additional support for their altered scriptures, the Watchtower has even turned to the occult. The New Testament, a Bible translation by Johannes Grieber, has been used as an authority in many of their publications. Johannes Grieber was a spiritualist, heavily involved with the occult. His translation was completed under the direction of spirit messengers, with the aid of his wife, who was a self-professed spirit medium. The willingness of the Watchtower to accept any authority is reflected in the words of Charles Taze Russell in the July 1879 issue of Zion's Watchtower, where he stated, A truth presented by Satan himself is just as true as a truth stated by God. Accept truth wherever you find it, no matter what it contradicts. This philosophy is reflected in the New World Translation of Jehovah's Witnesses. When early Watchtower teachings that the world entered the so-called time of the end in 1799, that Jesus returned invisibly in 1874, and that the world would end in 1914 were proven false, doctrine was conveniently readjusted. In the new version, 1914 became the date of both Christ's invisible return and the beginning of the time of the end. This date was put forth not as theory or interpretation, but as hard, indisputable fact. Watchtower Society official Eugene Mortensen.
Jehovah's Witnesses from their study of the Bible have firm belief in the fact that since the fall of 1914, Jesus has come into kingdom power. And as he prophesied in the 24th chapter of Matthew, the generation that saw the beginning of this time would not pass away until all things would be accomplished. That means also the end of this wicked system of things. The Watchtower Society is very concerned that time is running out for the so-called generation of 1914. The few who are still living are quite elderly, and should they all pass away before Armageddon, Jehovah's Witnesses will be faced with another false prophecy to explain. Anticipating this future embarrassment, the Chairman's Committee of the Governing Body actually prepared a document suggesting the date be changed from 1914 to 1957. Raymond Franz was a member of the Governing Body when this recommendation was considered. Now, in this document, they suggest and advance as a, an idea that uh, the generation that would see the time of the, the uh, end of all things should not be counted from 1914. They fix on Jesus' statement that there would be signs in the heavens. And so they suggest here that the date should be moved up to 1957 when the Sputnik was sent into space by the Russians and they say now this is the celestial phenomena that would indicate the generation that would see the final wind-up. The Sputnik idea was ultimately rejected by the governing body but for the generation of 1914 time is running out. How did the watchtower arrive at 1914 as an all-important date? Their chronology is based on the year 607 B.C., which they claim is the year Jerusalem fell to the Babylonians. Carl Olaf Johnson, Swedish author of the book The Gentile Times Reconsidered, is a former Jehovah's Witness elder and pioneer minister. I didn't question this chronology in the beginning because I thought the Bible supported it. I knew, of course, that... Uh, Historians uh, dated the, the desolation of Jerusalem not in 607, but in 587 uh, or 586. But uh, in 1968, I conducted a Bible study with a man who wanted to know why historians, they uh, prefer the date 20 years later. Uh, so I started to investigate the matter. And I soon discovered that um, historians had very strong evidence in their support. Johnson Trump. compiled his research and sent it to Watchtower headquarters. But, but the society's leaders were determined to keep their doctrinal system intact. I got the letter with a warning. I was warned that uh, I should not share my findings with uh, other witnesses. To conceal the facts and suppress his seven years of research, the Watchtower Society excommunicated Carl Olaf Johnson. Our teaching on Jesus Christ is that Jesus is the Son of God. He was the first thing that Jehovah created, and uh, through him other creative works were done. Now some religions teach that God and Jesus are one and the same, but the Bible does not teach that, and it, therefore neither do Jehovah's Witnesses. We believe that the Bible teaches that Jesus carries out a number of functions for Jehovah God, the Most High. For example, in the Hebrew Scriptures, he is referred to as Michael. Uh, Michael, literally translated into English, means who is like God. Witnesses believe that Jesus Christ is a spirit creature, a super angel, the first creation of Jehovah God, who prior to coming to earth as a man, existed in heaven as Michael the Archangel. Jesus started out originally as the Logos. Or Michael the Archangel. Who then came to earth as the virgin-born son of Mary. He was a perfect, sinless man. But he was only a man devoid of all divinity. Jesus walked the earth as a man, becoming the Christ only when he was baptized. Jehovah's Witnesses hold the cross in contempt, feeling that it is nothing more than a pagan symbol used by apostate Christendom. Instead, 
They teach that at the completion of his ministry, Jesus died, not on the cross, but on an upright stake. Christ's body was then laid in a tomb, where it was disintegrated by God, totally destroyed forever. Jesus was then recreated by the Father. Before going to heaven, he materialized in different bodies on different occasions to convince his disciples and others that he had really been resurrected. Jesus returned to his Father in heaven, where once again he became Michael the Archangel. He will never again be seen on the earth in visible form, but instead rules invisibly from the heavens. When he executes judgment over the world at Armageddon, he will destroy all but the faithful Jehovah's Witnesses. Michael, who will always remain invisible to those on earth, and can be seen only by the 144,000 select Jehovah's Witnesses who rule with him from heaven. If you should choose to accept the Watchtower's current prophecy of Armageddon, whatever that may be, and decide to protect yourself by becoming a Jehovah's Witness, you will find yourself in a unique two-class religion. Only the upper class, the 144,000 spoken of in Revelation, are guaranteed a place in heaven, and they are known as the anointed. The Watchtower Society teaches that the vast majority of Jehovah's Witnesses constitute a secondary group referred to as the other sheep. They have no heavenly hope, but must remain on earth for all eternity. Once a year, on the anniversary of the Last Supper, Jehovah's Witnesses and invited persons gather for this communion-like ceremony. Only members of the anointed class who are alive today, about 9,000 worldwide, partake of the bread and wine. The millions of other sheep will not take communion. The other sheep are not in the new covenant and therefore have no personal relationship with Jesus Christ. How then do they hope to attain salvation? The Jehovah's Witness is told he may not look to Jesus alone for everlasting life. As one of the other sheep, he must also depend on the Watchtower organization for his passage to paradise. In turn, the organization says he's required to earn his salvation largely by calling door to door. It's strange, but they seem able to <clears throat> teach two different things, opposite things, simultaneously. They agree that the Bible teaches that we are saved by grace, or, as they put it, God's undeserved kindness, and not by works. And yet, the average witness believes, he hasn't the slightest doubt, that unless he performs the works that are laid out for him by the Watchtower Society, the witnessing activity, going door to door, um, regular meeting attendance, and other things that are brought out, that he will never gain everlasting life. Once in the organization, witnesses attend five hours of meetings a week. In addition, they are expected to devote many hours a month going door to door, selling literature and gaining converts, striving always to prove themselves worthy of escaping God's wrath at Armageddon. Even though we, we believe that God was love, we are always afraid that he was going to zap us, that sometime Armageddon might hit and we might not make it. Even if, even if we didn't go out from the door-to-door -door ministry on a weekend and took our family out, uh, out to the lake or something, we didn't go out from door-to-door, -door, we felt guilty all the time. In order to keep a close check on the activities of each member, the organization requires them to turn in a monthly time report 
if they want to be retained on the rolls as active Jehovah's Witnesses. We don't keep any membership records per se, but uh, the only record we have is those who actually go door-to-door -door preaching. Today, when the new Jehovah's Witness is baptized, rather than using the biblical format of baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the witness is baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit-directed organization. This is a dedication to them that is without any reservation. They are now going to set their entire life aside to do their Creator's will, Thus baptized, the Jehovah's Witness is now committed to slave for the organization until the world comes to an end. Jehovah's Witnesses exist in a rigid, structured, thou shalt not environment. They are forbidden to vote or hold elective office, celebrate holidays, belong to the YMCA or YWCA, salute the flag, sing the national anthem, or participate in other patriotic activities. They can't serve in the military or work for a military organization. They may not accept blood transfusions, read anything critical of the Watchtower Society, or associate with former Jehovah's Witnesses. They are forbidden to even attend church. If life is narrow for the adult witness, the problem is greatly intensified for their school-aged children. The Watchtower Society has published a book entitled School and Jehovah's Witnesses. It defines for schools what activities witness children are forbidden to participate in. Things like birthday celebrations, Christmas and Easter, sports, Mother's or Father's Day, Valentine's Day or Thanksgiving, saluting the flag or school dances, singing the national anthem or saying the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. Children are real victims in this. Jehovah's Witness children cannot participate in many of the normal school activities and as a result are often mocked by their classmates. They are really torn because on one hand they want to please their parents and on the other hand, they want to be accepted by their teachers and classmates. There is no way they can win. They are literally torn apart emotionally. I know this firsthand because my own daughter cried nearly every day in school from the first time she entered until an extremely loving teacher made her feel at ease in the fourth grade. The life of a witness child is very isolated because playing with non-witness schoolmates and neighborhood children is considered bad association. The Watchtower Society presents Jehovah's Witnesses as clean, happy, and unquestionably moral. The Bible has a lot to say about family life, and the reason Jehovah's Witnesses have such happy families is because we try to apply the principles that are found in the Bible. This protects them from many of the pressures and the problems that afflict a family life today. For example, Jehovah's Witnesses, while not immune to the pressures and problems, are able to cope with the difficulties that husbands and wives face, that children are confronted with every day. And so we have a very low incident of family dissolving or juvenile delinquency, drug abuse, and alcoholism. And that shows the benefit and the profit of following God's Word closely. Former Jehovah's Witnesses disagree. Growing up as a child within Jehovah's Witnesses, I always thought that this was God's clean organization. But when I got older, I found out that there were divorces, there was gross immorality within the congregations, and that we were actually no different than the ones we were condemning. As an elder, I saw the seedy side of the congregation. Members would come to me with their problems, and I found out that even elders were involved sometimes in crooked business practices and in immorality. And I began to discover that we were really no better than the people on the outside of the organization. When I left Bethel, it was hard for me to even share with my mother and father what was going on up there, the, the drunken parties that went on and, and the homosexuality and things like this. 
Finally, the Watchtower had to admit that immorality had spread to the highest levels of the organization, saying, Shocking as it is, even some who have been prominent in Jehovah's organization have succumbed to immoral practices, including homosexuality, wife swapping, and child molesting. Alcoholism, depression, and mental disorders among Jehovah's Witnesses have come to the attention of psychiatric professionals. Dr. Jerry Bergman is a former Jehovah's Witness and a trained psychologist. In my experience in working for a number of psychiatric clinics as a therapist, I've worked with many, many Jehovah's Witnesses, and I find that many of them suffer from severe emotional problems, from schizophrenia, from severe depression, alcoholism, and other problems. I've also consulted the scientific literature on this question, and I found that it clearly confirms that the mental illness rate among the witnesses is clearly above average. One of the most intimidating devices used by the Watchtower Society is the threat of appearing before a judicial committee of elders. Public censure, even disfellowshipping, can be the sentence of this powerful court. The inflexibility of Watchtower policies has led to thousands of instances of mental distress, even suicide. Dottie Hike's family experienced the cold steel of Watchtower doctrine when her 16-year-old son, Billy, became romantically involved with a married Jehovah's Witness woman. Conscience-stricken, Billy turned to his parents. He was very upset, extremely distraught, and he just didn't know what to do. And he was making statements like, I just can't go on, I just can't face this. And he was threatening to commit suicide. My husband and I talked with him for hours and did everything and said everything we knew to do to try to get him to realize that there's no situation too bad that you can't face. But things just were not getting any better. So as witnesses, you're taught not to seek the professional help of anyone. So we felt our hands were so tied we didn't know what to do. The family turned to an elder of the congregation for help. The elder called Billy outside, and his parents felt a solution was near. But their hopes were short-lived. We felt the elder would really have some kind of words of consolation for him, even though no one condoned what he had done. This boy was reaching out for help, and he did need someone to console him. And he felt so guilty, and so at a loss. And instead, the elder just said, the committee will deal with you tomorrow. He went out to my husband's truck, where he kept a small amount of Paraquat in a container. And Billy took the Paraquat, and he took one swallow of it. We had him in the hospital within 20 minutes. Exactly three weeks later, he died. <laughs> Did the witness congregation respond with compassion to this tragedy? Billy's sister, Rhonda. When he died, it really devastated me. At his memorial service, none of his friends that he'd known all of his life were able to attend, and that really hurt me. The Jehovah's Witnesses claimed to bring the families together. Through them, my brother killed himself. My mother tried to kill herself. My two sisters and my brother will not speak to me. My grandmother will not speak to me. She wouldn't let me see my grandfather before he passed away. They didn't bring our family close together. They nearly, totally destroyed it. While the members of the governing body may escape blame for the death of one desperate boy, they can hardly escape responsibility for their policies in the African country of Malawi. Policies that left thousands of witnesses raped, homeless, or dead. In the mid-1960s in the African country of Malawi, all citizens were ordered by the government to purchase a 25-cent party identification card. Jehovah's Witnesses were forbidden by the Watchtower Society's branch office from complying with that law. As a result, Jehovah's Witnesses suffered a terrible persecution. Homes and crops were burned, thousands of women were raped, and some 20,000 witnesses were forced to flee Malawi into neighboring countries 
to live in refugee camps, their lives scarred forever. Now, Jehovah's Witnesses uh, are taught that it's a sin to be involved in any way with politics. They're also taught that it's just as great a sin to have anything to do with the military. But we have two situations, one in a country in Africa, Malawi, and another in Mexico, where two opposite rulings were allowed to stay in effect at the same time, and it's almost unbelievable, the, the results of this. When Jehovah's Witnesses living in Mexico heard that their brothers had suffered this terrible persecution over a 25-cent party card, they were conscience-stricken. Because in Mexico, every young man is expected to fulfill one year of military service. He receives what's called a cartilla, a certificate. The witnesses customarily and regularly would bribe a military official to fill out this card stating that they had completed their military instruction and that they were now in the first reserves of the army. Why were they doing this? They gave me copies of letters from the Watchtower Society's headquarters in New York stating that this was purely a matter for individual conscience and that if the person felt he could do this, pay a bribe to a military official, get this card saying he had completed his military training was now a member of the First Reserves, this was up to him. Jehovah's Witnesses believe the men who make up the governing body are chosen and directed by God. Yet out of apparent indifference or ignorance or worse, the governing body allowed witnesses to illegally bribe officials while at the same time holding others to a policy that resulted in their wholesale rape and slaughter. It's difficult for me to believe these actions were inspired by God. The controlled tentacles of the governing body extend even into the life and death world of medical treatment. In the 17th chapter of Leviticus in the 10th verse, it states that one should not eat blood of any sort. This means that God does not want us to sustain our life off of the life of some other creature. And that for that reason, because God has forbidden it, we abstain from taking blood. The blood issue in the back of our minds was bothering us because as Jehovah's Witnesses, if we freely gave a blood transfusion to our daughter, we'd be excommunicated, we'd be disfellowshipped. Well, the doctors finally came to our room and they just, it was just like an ultimatum. They said, listen, we know from our records that you're a Jehovah's Witness. We know that you don't take blood transfusions. And the doctor looked me straight in the eye and said, Mr. and Mrs. Blizzard, you have to make a decision, yes or no, whether your child lives or dies. I remember going over to the bed and she had these cords and wires keeping her alive, life support systems, and, and holding this limp child that was our only daughter, and, and, and just going over to the window and looking out and watching the clouds and the sky, and, and just started to weep. And I said, oh God, Jehovah, and I prayed to Jehovah. We just had a real distinct impression that we were supposed to obey God's law and go by what we had always been taught, and that we were to let our daughter die. And so we just called the doctors back in and told them that we had just had to let her die, that we had to obey God's law. About a half an hour later, a sheriff deputy came to our room and gave my wife and I both citations, and they told us that a court order has already been issued, uh, your daughter is going to get the blood, and they also warned the staff of the hospital not to allow us to take Jenny out of the hospital. And we were charged with child neglect and abuse. The witnesses, there was multitudes of them that came up to the room, just swarmed the room, tried to give in a, giving us Watchtower articles about uh, artificial blood, and, and uh, you just can't let your child take that blood, and just putting this heavy guilt trip on us. The elders were relieved to find out that there was still time to get Jenny out of the hospital, and they would, they would come up to me and say, hey, I've got a plan. We can get her, we can hire a helicopter, we can sneak her out of this hospital, just unhook the tubes, and, and we're gone. And I said, wait a minute. You can't do that. It's against, it's against the law. I'll be charged with murder. They said, that's a chance you're going to have to take. And I just told them, look, I just can't let my child die in that way. And the elders were just so upset. They left in a huff. They were mad. And one of the elders said on the way out, he looked me in the eye and said, you know what? I hope your daughter gets hepatitis from that blood. And that was just the straw that broke the camel's back. I was just broken here. My own people. God's organization turning against me, cursing me, 
because I just wanted to see my child live. And so they left. And we were all alone. Even my own parents didn't come see us. I think many times Jehovah's Witnesses have really never thought the blood thing through. It's either right or it's wrong. If it's wrong, the Watchtower Society is guilty of causing the deaths of thousands of people. That's wrong. It's evil. I think the evil needs to be seen for what it is. It's this concept, this organizational concept, that the organization is everything. You see, <clears throat> Jehovah's Witnesses believe that this organization is God's one channel, that all of God's direction for people on the earth comes through this channel. And the men on the governing body believe it. I believed it. And that's the reason I was party to some things in the past that today I, I feel shame to think that I even had part in them. If the governing body of the Watchtower Society holds and enjoys the power, then they must also bear the responsibility. The truth is, they don't. Nothing better illustrates this than their false prophecy concerning 1975. Well, when the society brought out the date 1975, I felt right away that th this is going to be the date when the thing has to happen because there was no other date beyond 1975 that anybody could point to. So uh, I grabbed right a hold of it. It was, it was a thing to do, and uh, I put all my hopes in it. By the mid-60s, the Watchtower Society had all but guaranteed that the world would come to an end in 1975. It was a prophecy that would bring in a flood of new members, and the organization prospered. But it would have other effects on the ordinary Jehovah's Witness. We thought Armageddon was coming in 1975. So I did not have a career. I didn't go to college because the end was so close. There was no need. The new world would be here. Uh, I was a senior in high school, and the circuit overseer, which is a traveling minister, advised me that it's best for you to quit school and go into the full-time pioneer work because the world is going to end in 1975. We felt so strongly about the imminent approach of 1975 and that this whole system was coming to an end that we sold our home in Lower Michigan, moved north, built a Kingdom Hall, and there we intended to live out those few remaining years, having saved just enough money to go a few years beyond 1975. And so it was a great disappointment and distress when this event that the Watchtower had prophesied did not materialize. I wanted to get married, I wanted to have children, but because the end was so close, when Fred and I got married, we decided that we would postpone having children. So I believe we sacrificed a lot within the organization. Well, when the end of the world didn't come in 1975, and that prophecy of the Watchtower failed, I begin to wonder if they were wrong on this, how many others are they wrong on? And once again, Watchtower fact was revealed as nothing more than contrived fantasy. Jehovah's Witnesses tried to get an explanation, but were unsuccessful. Apparently, for the governing body, nothing is so invisible as an unpleasant truth. Today, they are quick to deny their prophecies for the end of the world. We do not, nor have we attempted, to predict a day or a time for it. The history and prophecies of the Watchtower Society are easily revealed as fabrications and distortions by simply reading the material they've published from the beginning. Their greatest enemy is their own literature, which clearly shows the man-made nature of their theology. Jehovah's Witness leaders have continually covered up and rewritten their ever-changing doctrines each time presenting them as new light. The one thing the Watchtower Society cannot tolerate in the organization is critical thinking. That's why they forbid their followers to read any material which might expose their deceptions. really shocked me to my core was this, and every other Jehovah's Witness listening to this, is that we were so convinced that the leadership, the governing body, would never tell one lie. Mm -hmm. They would always speak the truth, yes. no matter what the truth was. Mm -hmm. That is a fabrication, it is a lie, they have lied to us, they have deceived us, and we have the documented evidence. And because we've spoken about it, we were silenced, or threatened to be silenced. And that's what will happen to any Jehovah's Witness listening to this program. And he knows it in his heart. He knows it in his heart. I saw in the body that most of our time was spent discussing the formation 
of new rulings, all designed to keep the witnesses in and to keep bad people out, to act as that kind of offense. And again and again, the decisions had absolutely no basis in the Bible. The witness who breaks these executive commandments is subject to disfellowshipping, the watchtower's word for excommunication. Jehovah's Witnesses practice removing those who refuse to conform to right principles from among themselves. The Bible refers to this and supports this practice as preventing leaven or false thinking or teaching from entering into the congregation, thereby maintaining its purity or its cleanliness. I went to a Christian church with my husband and they disfellowshipped me for that. They believe that when you, when you become, uh, when you leave the organization, you go to the devil anyway, but if you ever join a church, this is the ultimate sin. They believe that it's committing spiritual fornication with the devil. In my uh, job assignment at the, the Brooklyn Bethel headquarters, I would often process disfellowshippings which came in from all the various congregations in the United States. And they literally amounted to hundreds that would come in every week. It just shows the, the magnitude of the number of people that are disfellowshipped by the organization. And of course, careful records are kept on all of this. And, and including all the, the intimate details of uh, what the individual did, what kind of offense it was. Mainly there are sex offenses, but there are other offenses too, like uh, smoking, uh, perhaps celebrating the holidays, uh, things like that, that people also got disfellowship for. If uh, one actually becomes a dissenter to the point of becoming apostate, then we follow the Bible counsel and we uh, never invite him into our house or would say a greeting to him. If a person resigns, they are treated exactly the same as a person who is disfellowshipped. When my husband and I resigned by sending in a letter of disassociation, we were not merely dropped from membership. We were actually shunned as being evil. Even today, if a Jehovah's Witness is caught associating with us, they are subject to being disfellowshipped themselves. There is no honorable way out of this religion. Because of the way that they had treated my family, I disassociated myself from the Watchtower Society, never dreaming that my children would refuse to have anything to do with me. In fact, I have a little two-year-old grandson that I've never even seen. My two children and my five grandchildren are forbidden to see me, their grandmother, because of the Watchtower. What kind of organization, going under the heading of Christian, would this allow the children and grandchildren to see their mother and grandmother? Every person will recognize the Watchtower's practice of shunning as a cold, unloving, evil thing. The lives of the disfellowshipped are filled with the chill of loneliness, the never-ending sadness of separation from family members. To find something to believe in, to trust in, is very hard. Since I believed that they were the only channel to God, I couldn't bring myself to come to any other church to search for God in any other way. Normally, Jehovah's Witnesses are taught that when they leave the organization, there's nowhere to go. But my wife and I, through Bible reading, found out that we could go to Christ. And that's what we have done. After I'd ran across some literature that exposed their false prophecies and their deceitful ways of covering up, I then was able to realize that they weren't God's organization and I was able to search for God. And I found Jesus Christ and He is my personal Savior and He's changed my life just a hundred percent. We just uh, prayed and gave our heart to Jesus and it seemed like such it was such a simple answer but that was, that was what we've been searching for all our life and it wasn't an organization, it was Jesus, it was a personal relationship with Jesus that we didn't have before. We knew at that very moment that our names were written in the Lamb's Book of Life. It was, it was a free gift, eternal life just given to us. And all those works that we did, all the thousands of hours that we, that we put in for an organization, all the hard striving was finished. And just grace, just grace saved us through faith, just a simple act of obedience and prayer and asking the Lord to take over and just filled us with joy and peace a joy that we never had never had as a witness
Marjorie and I spent many years working for the Watchtower Society, but it wasn't until we left the organization that we discovered the real meaning of God's love. Our experience says to us that there's another ministry out there for Christians, a ministry that will come knocking on their door. The Jehovah's Witness who comes to your door is a person who's lost his way. If you're prepared, you can reach out and show him what true Christian fellowship is. It's been a long journey for us, but we don't think it's been wasted. The remainder of our years are going to be all the more precious to us because now we have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. We finally came to realize that eternal life is a free gift. God's grace was all we needed. Just grace. is a touchy subject in a court of law. This is especially so when dealing with child custody cases. Oftentimes, the legal profession is at a disadvantage when religion plays a major role in custody cases. The most difficult custody cases often involve the religion called Jehovah's Witnesses, who distribute literature for the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society and pattern their lives according to its strict rules. Most times, one mate is a staunch Jehovah's Witness and wishes to bring up the children according to the dictates of this religion. The other mate is equally determined to have the children raised without the influence of this group. Jeff Atkinson, former chairman of the American Bar Association's Child Custody Case Committee, remarks. I believe Jehovah's Witnesses are probably responsible for half of the contested custody cases that are in courts of review around the country. Since the best interests of the children are the concern of the court, we need to look at the lifestyle of a typical Jehovah's Witness child. Jehovah's Witness children must attend five meetings a week with their parents. There are no special children's classes or facilities for babies. They are taught to sit quietly for an average of two hours at a time. At an early age, they accompany their parents from door to door presenting watchtower literature. Association with children not of their religion is discouraged. They are further isolated in school by having to refuse participation in the Oath of Allegiance, saluting the flag, and singing the national anthem. They are discouraged from participation in school plays, school elections, and school clubs. Forbidden to witness children are birthdays, Christmas, Easter, Valentine's Day, Halloween, May Day, Mother's Day, Father's Day, Thanksgiving, or observance of any national day. Extracurricular activities, including sports events, are discouraged. All these activities are considered unwholesome to the Jehovah's Witness parents. Children are encouraged to spend any spare moments promoting their religious activities. School breaks, they are taught, are for going door to door promoting their religion. Living as a child of Jehovah's Witnesses is living a life of isolation from the children at school. The life of a Jehovah's Witness child is not an easy one. My second son got into the wrong crowd, and I feel it could have been avoided if he would have had the opportunity to play sports with other children his age. Heard all of that, but Judge Buska that discusses his experience in a child custody case involving Jehovah's Witnesses. Factors. The main thing in the Estes case, the main evidence which I considered and which resulted in the decision I made uh, changing the custody from the mother to the father uh, was the alienating behavior of the mother following Jehovah's Witnesses. 
Since the Jehovah's Witness religion plays such a large part in a child's upbringing, can it be ignored in custody decisions? It's true that the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution states, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Does this not prohibit an examination of religious teachings in the courtroom? No. Many precedents have been set in the courts allowing the examination of the Jehovah's Witness religion as it affects the best interests of the child. The cases are very clear that while the freedom of religion is inviolate, there are restrictions and limitations on the practice of that, of that uh, religious concept uh, insofar as they may cause damage or present harm or potential harm to children, they can be regulated by the state and prohibited. A judge does not decide which religion is right or wrong, and I put those terms in quotes, um, nor does he make any a judgment with respect to anyone's practice of their own religious beliefs except as they may impact on the rights of others. In 1988, the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society printed a booklet entitled Preparing for Child Custody Cases. It is designed to be utilized by Jehovah's Witnesses and their attorneys. The society expects their religious views to be discussed in court. Duane Magnani, expert consultant in custody cases, comments on the booklet. This revealing booklet warns Jehovah's Witnesses your religious practices and teachings as one of Jehovah's Witnesses will probably be a subject of inquiry by your former spouse in the court. So Jehovah's Witnesses have been told to expect to discuss their lifestyle in court. This booklet, in fact, coaches Jehovah's Witnesses to misrepresent their lifestyle in a court of law. The Jehovah's Witness parent is told to present himself or herself as an independent thinker who makes personal decisions about parenting. This is far from the truth of the matter. I think it was designed and encourages the Jehovah's Witness to cover up some of their true beliefs and to mislead the court as to what their beliefs and practices are with reference to children. Well, for 25 years, I had defended the society as being the truth. So it was a surprise to me to find out that in this booklet, the society was actually coaching our kids to lie in court about their lifestyle and teachings. It was obvious to me that the reason behind this was so that they could shield themselves from negative consequences in court. Well, this upset me so much that I wrote the society, and one of the questions that I asked them was, if this booklet was truthful, then why wasn't the information being published for all of Jehovah's Witnesses? Well, it was obvious that the information in this booklet was not the truth. And so this eventually led to my disassociating from the Watchtower Society. The witness organization is greatly embarrassed that this booklet has been exposed to the court by non-Jehovah's Witnesses. In fact, in a case in which I testified, the Watchtower attorney, Gregory Oles, attempted to show preparing for child custody cases was not a Watchtower publication. But in the very same case, another Watchtower attorney, Carolyn Waugh, admitted to co-writing it. The booklet, Preparing for Child Custody Cases, recommends the giving of testimony under oath, which is known to be untrue. Now, by the statutory definitions, that's perjury. Individual Jehovah's Witnesses are very much under the control of the congregational elders, who in turn answer to the Watchtower Society headquarters. Now, to the extent the parent says, I believe everything that the Watchtower Society tells me to believe, and then you have firm evidence that this is exactly what the Watchtower Society believes, then in effect, the Watchtower beliefs could be attributed to the parent. This elder arrangement of the Jehovah's Witnesses is very controlling and allows for very little independent thinking. Dr. Jerry Bergman, an expert on the psychology of Jehovah's Witnesses, comments. Individual Jehovah's Witnesses are strongly discouraged from thinking for themselves. 
They are repeatedly taught that only the Watchtower organization is God's channel of communication. They are required to believe everything taught in the Watchtower magazine. They are also instructed to avoid independent thinking. Jehovah's Witness parents must submit to the organization's instructions for raising children. The real parents of Jehovah's Witness children is the organization. Jehovah's Witnesses have even affectionately called the organization their mother. If the parent has agreed that they follow all the tenets of the Jehovah Witness faith, then those tenets, including refusal of blood transfusions, can become relevant. The life of a Jehovah's Witness child is daily affected by the fear of the end of the world, the foretold Battle of Armageddon, in which everyone except faithful members will be destroyed by Jehovah God. Children are very affected by this doomsday mentality of the Watchtower Society. Heavy pressure is put on them to avoid seeking higher education or a career due to the shortness of time left before the end. In fact, in 1957, children were told that most of the boys and girls today would be destroyed at Armageddon while still in their youth because they didn't convert to Jehovah's Witnesses. Children have been traumatized in the past by the doomsday dates of 1914, 1918, 1925, the World War II period, and 1975, and now expect the end at any moment. They are taught that no one will survive this latest doomsday except faithful Jehovah's Witnesses. I was always taught that if you weren't a Jehovah's Witness, you were going to die. So when my parents told me we were not going to be Jehovah's Witnesses, I thought we were just going to die. I did not know what they were doing. Under oath, Watchtower attorney Carolyn Waugh has testified that Jehovah's Witnesses believe that other people, such as Methodists, may survive Armageddon. The facts show otherwise. To survive, the literature tells people they must join Jehovah's Witnesses. This belief that everyone other than Jehovah's Witnesses is of Satan the devil has far-reaching consequences in custodial cases. If the courts award the child to the Jehovah's Witness parent, this child grows up believing that the non-witness parent will be destroyed by Jehovah God. The child in this situation lives in an atmosphere of fear the child is taught that other relatives who are not Jehovah's Witnesses are bad associations. All non-witness friends are bad associations. The non-witness parent is likewise a bad association. It is an ongoing traumatic situation for a child. How does this affect the child's outlook for the future as far as choosing a career in life? In my heart, I really believed that volunteering my time as a full-time pioneer in the door-to-door -door ministry every day, promoting the Jehovah's Witnesses' faith, was the most important thing in my life. All this leads to social isolation. Jehovah's Witness children must be prepared to be isolated even from their classmates when school activities conflict with Watchtower teachings. The following report shows just how tragic the life of these children can be. Tonight, Dimension examines what could have led to the tragic and mystifying deaths of two young brothers nearly a year ago. You may have heard about the Wisconsin case last August. Two brothers, ages 10 and 13, on their way to school, found shot to death. Authorities believe the two boys killed themselves, and at the time, the only explanation from the family, the boys didn't like school. As with any of the growing number of child suicides, in this case, it is impossible to isolate a single cause. But Dimension has learned the young Wisconsin brothers lived in a lonely and frightening world, a world their mother blames on religious beliefs. Trish Van Pilsen has tonight's Dimension Report. The school bus comes down the dusty road and rumbles right past the house now. The kids the bus used to stop here for are dead. This is my brother Robert. And he was how old there? Um, I think 13. And this was a picture of my brother Ben. I used to ride bike with them, and um, and they always picked on me. 
But I do miss them. But Robert and Benjamin Moore did not enjoy the carefree lives of other children. Certainly not of their classmates at this tiny school on West Schoolhouse Road. There was something scary, something lonely about their childhood. Something that made them slip from the house one morning, drive an old beater car down this quiet hiking trail, and kill themselves. And when I, I think probably they killed themselves to avoid getting killed at Armageddon. And they learned about Armageddon where? From the Watchtower. The Watchtower Society, or the Church of the Jehovah's Witnesses. The boys had been attending it with their father. One of its central teachings, that God will someday destroy everyone but worthy members of the Watchtower Society, leaving those witnesses to live in paradise. All those people being killed, that's pretty scary. Those people would include the boy's mother, who left the Watchtower Society 10 years ago. God's angry and he's going to kill everybody. And that scared Benjamin. So bad association, spoil useful habits. Do you feel like they were isolated at all from other kids? I think so. What makes you think that? <clears throat> well, because... Um, because being that religion, you have to be different. And that automatically isolates you. Only after the boys had died did their mother find what she believes are clues, indications the boys had planned dead. ahead. Okay, so this is what they were taught was going to happen. Yeah, uh, a blood up to the horse's neck. This is Armageddon. Jehovah guarantees it. When there were notations in their Bible study books. This is the watchtower. Delay can be deadly. And here's a map of the trail. This watchtower is March 1st, 1993. Here's where Route 13, and here's where Spring Road goes up, and here's where the trail goes in. And there it says end. The boys' funerals were held at the Kingdom Hall over their mother's objection. She says during the entire service, not a word was spoken about the boys themselves. And worse, she says, members treated her as though the deaths were her fault because she had broken away from the church. We'll never know for sure what happened on this trail that morning, whether it was something at school, at home, or their church that bothered the boys so much. But their mom is desperately worried that whatever it was might affect their sister as well. Yeah, she is sweet, but I don't know what I'd do without her. <laughs> Lisa's dad takes her to the Kingdom Hall now. She says she doesn't like it. In the past week, she stayed home from school twice, complaining of stomach aches. Her parents say she can choose what to believe. Her mom hopes she's strong enough to do that. For Dimension, I'm Trish Van Pilsen. The Jehovah's Witness child is taught that the government is controlled by Satan. This includes the courts and the legal system. The Jehovah's Witnesses never vote or serve in the military. Since they believe the court system is under the control of Satan, can their testimony under oath be reliable? those outside the religion, outside Jehovah's Witnesses, the Jehovah's Witness organization, uh, are of Satan. And that includes Dad. And uh, this is not the first time I've heard that kind of evidence. I've uh, heard it before in visitation matters, which were ultimately resolved between the parties, but involved a little boy bringing home from school a, a picture of Dad with horns, because Dad was... Uh, reputed to be a devil by the mother and by the Jehovah's Witnesses' teachings. The element that you see in a lot of these cases is a, also a kind of an alienation from the other, you know, the extended family group. One they should be most interested in is to what degree does one parent try to alienate the child from the other parent based on religion. The First Amendment rights of religious freedom and free speech are not an excuse to try to convince the child that there's something wrong with the other parent. And the child has a right to a good relationship with both parents. And if one parent is busy undermining the other parent, that should be a negative factor against that parent. The end result is to alienate the child from anything and everything that's not of Jehovah's Witnesses. 
alienation of the child from one parent is a serious, significant fact that the courts regularly pay attention to. Jehovah's Witnesses believe it is proper to hide the truth from God's enemies. They are instructed to tell the truth only to those who are entitled to know the truth. Since the court is sometimes seen as God's enemy, it isn't necessarily entitled to know the truth. So Jehovah's Witness parents have been known to deliberately misrepresent their beliefs and practices in the courtroom. Because there's nothing wrong under the religion as I understand it in misleading or even lying to somebody that's not a Jehovah's Witness. I think it's really very clear that, uh, that uh, the book that is sent out is there to instruct the adherents, Jehovah's Witnesses, who find themselves involved in custody cases, how to avoid uh, getting themselves in a position where they have to say what it is that they're really practicing with respect to their kids, with respect to the way their children live, and with respect to the limitations that are placed upon those children for their psychological and emotional and social development. It's real clear. Under their beliefs, as I understand them, there are only two kinds of persons in this world. Jehovah's Witnesses and those who are not. And uh, those who are not are of Satan and outside the organization. It has been evident in case after case that Jehovah's Witnesses will take the stand and misrepresent their true beliefs under oath. They are coached by their own elders to do so. Attorneys need to be aware of these tactics when involved in child custody cases and divorces involving Jehovah's Witnesses. Failure by any baptized Jehovah's Witness to fully conform to the dictates of the Watchtower organization results in a practice called disfellowshipping, or shunning. This would include Jehovah's Witness children. Carolyn Waugh often specializes as Watchtower attorney in child custody cases. She also testified as an expert witness. Under oath, she has claimed, quote, there is no break between the relationship between parent and child, unquote. This watchtower says only necessary family matters require limited contact with the disfellowship children. This policy certainly signifies a break in the relationship between parent and child. Uh, shunning is an important part of their practice. Shunning all persons who are not Jehovah's Witnesses, except for business dealings, just what's absolutely necessary. And my brother, who I dearly loved, uh, shunned me. Uh, three months after our disfellowshipping, my mother was killed in an automobile accident. Uh, this was in South Texas. Uh, it was a small congregation, and our family sat on the front row as the eulogy was given. After it was over, the brother stepped off the platform, and he offered condolences to the rest of my family, but he looked over my head and my husband's head and gave a message to the congregation as to how they should behave toward us. It was incredibly cruel, calculated, and I knew at that point that I could never let that happen to anyone else in my family again. She uh, was disfellowshipped. Uh, it's a very difficult thing to do. Uh, obviously, you, you love your, your family members. When someone is disfellowshipped, uh, the organizational teachings are that you have nothing to do with them. I, of course, was a ministerial servant at the time, and that added further obligation to carry forth that requirement to have nothing to do with, with her. And uh, as difficult as that was, that's what was, was required. My daughter's response at about age eight, when she began to shun me, this brought on a low self-worth as a human being, as well as a parent. It was a very devastating, a very difficult uh, experience. Jehovah's Witnesses are taught, we must hate in the truest sense which is to regard with extreme and active aversion, to consider as loathsome, odious, filthy, 
to detest. It was a very awful situation for me because I felt if I didn't hate my dad and his side of the family that I couldn't really relate to my mother because of the Jehovah Witness and all that. And so I felt very uncomfortable toward the whole situation, you know, because my mom would always teach me to hate my dad and I thought it was because of, you know, him being disfellowshipped and being out of the religion. As I'm older now and I look back on it, I felt as if it's very wrong, you know, for especially a mother to teach her own child to do something like that, you know. In another court document, Watchtower attorney Carolyn Waugh claimed that shunned is not a term that is used. However, in the elder's handbook, the statement is made, disfellowshipped and disassociated ones are shunned. Well, I had been an elder for a number of years, and I knew what the rules were. I had to shun my children, and they couldn't talk to me. And since they knew that uh, all I would do anyway is tell them, you just obey what the watchtower says. Uh, and they were right. That's exactly the way I would have answered them. I had to agree with my husband. It was very painful to me. I still can't believe I did that to my own children. I felt abandoned and I felt alone, but I knew that the society came first. Even though my sister Sue was a Jehovah Witness, she just would not shun me, and then that led to her eventually being thrown out of Jehovah Witnesses too. Well, it came to the point that uh, I finally saw that the, the policy of shunning really uh, was just hurting families, not just mine. It was breaking families up, and uh, I just couldn't take the lack of compassion anymore. I was disfellowshipped from the Jehovah's Witnesses. My father told people I was dead. Since I have moved out of the family home, I can only speak to my parents about necessary business, nothing else. The pain is so bad from the shunning that I'm seeking counseling. Through my years growing up, I always had a close-knit family. My mother and I were the best of friends. After I made my decision to leave the organization, my family cut off all communication with me. My mother sent me this note. Chris, please do not call or write at any time while you retain your present association. These matters are not open for discussion. Thank you. Mom. The father, for instance, the father who says to his very beautiful young daughter, I could cut your heart out uh, when she came to ask about his well-being because he'd been in a serious situation. His response was, I could cut your heart out. The Watchtower organization requires absolute obedience to themselves. Jehovah's Witnesses often find themselves with conflicts of interest not only with the courts, but in their places of employment. Loyalty to the Watchtower organization compels a Jehovah's Witness to engage in unethical and possibly illegal activity. For example, if a Jehovah's Witness employee working in a legal or medical office found out from confidential files that another Jehovah's Witness had broken the society's rules, the employee would break confidentiality to report the person to the elders. Through this spy network, the elders find out if any of their members have had venereal diseases, abortions, or if a single sister has gotten birth control pills. In this way, the organization requires witnesses to violate either their own promises to others or even the law itself. Even though this is a betrayal of the patient's right of confidentiality and could lead to a lawsuit against a doctor or attorney, this is a watchtower policy. Of concern to the courts is the health and well-being of Jehovah's Witness children. The Watchtower Society forbids the use of blood transfusions as a medical treatment, even to save a child's life. Many times in the past, the courts have had to intervene on a child's behalf in order for him to receive a court-ordered transfusion. Jehovah's Witnesses have been known to take their minor children out of hospitals to prevent them from receiving blood transfusions. Another significant issue that comes up is the issue of blood transfusions. If there's a record in the case that the child has needed or is likely to need a blood transfusion and the Jehovah Witness parent is not going to provide it, 
that could be a significant factor in favor of custody for the parent who would provide the needed health care. Sandy Austin paid the ultimate price for her loyalty to the Watchtower Society. Yes, they said Nathan would die without a transfusion, and they said they wouldn't do the surgery without um, blood. Well, of course, I was very concerned regarding, you know, the heart operation itself, but I really believe the Watchtower's claim um, regarding the blood substitutes. So we flew to Texas, and Nathan did have a no-blood operation. The doctors um, said he wasn't doing well, and he was getting weaker and weaker, and the doctors said it was because of the blood. Faithful Jehovah's Witnesses would stand by and see their child die without a blood transfusion to give him a better chance in the new world. They would be regarded as faithful and loyal by other witnesses. Nevertheless, they are given instructions in this booklet. You do not want to give the impression that your religion requires you to allow your child to die should a medical emergency arise. In fact, just the opposite is true. Jehovah's Witness parents will allow their child to die while refusing blood they're required to do so. It was really hard at first because I had to admit that I didn't do everything I needed to do for my son and um, I had to admit that I should have given him blood. Jehovah's Witnesses have been taught by their organization that blood transfusions might prolong the child's life briefly here on earth but that child could lose his everlasting life by receiving a blood transfusion. If the child is baptized he could be disfellowshipped and shunned. The organization has even condoned the illegal removal of children from hospitals in the past. Jehovah's Witnesses will violate court orders regarding blood transfusions under the influence of the Watchtower Society. Jehovah's Witnesses are encouraged to resist court orders that conflict with organization instructions. Here are actual instructions from Watchtower headquarters. If a court-ordered transfusion seemed likely, a Christian might choose to avoid being accessible for such a violation of God's law. If a Christian puts forth very strenuous efforts to avoid a violation of God's law on blood, authorities might consider him a lawbreaker or make him liable to prosecution. If punishment did result, the Christian could view it as suffering for the sake of righteousness. Even Watchtower attorney Carolyn Waugh had to admit that for a baptized 12-year-old girl member of Jehovah's Witnesses, there would be resistance to a court-ordered transfusion. Therefore, according to this mandate, the entire court system has been totally stripped of its authority to enforce court orders on Jehovah's Witness parents in medical emergencies. Jehovah's Witnesses are prepared to keep their children out of hospitals or remove them from hospitals in order to avoid transfusions. The cult involvement of the Bisson family almost cost them their son, Joshua. No, I refused the court order, and as a result, Pam and I were charged with uh, child neglect, and our son was taken from us for about six weeks. When I first started studying with the witnesses, one of the first studies, I said to them that I could believe anything that the society would teach me, but the one thing that I would never, ever even consider was to give one of my children up to the blood issue. And little did I know that 10 years later, I would do that very thing. So it shows me how we can be brainwashed. Now that I look back, I'm real sad at the situation because knowing how much my parents love me and not being able to give me blood to help me, it must have been really hard for them. Jehovah's Witnesses do not consider themselves bound by any orders of any court which violate instructions from their own organization. Even though Jehovah's Witnesses have been taught that judges have no right to order a transfusion, they urge their parents seeking custody to appear reasonable and ready to talk about viable alternatives. We quote, Like holidays and the celebration of Christmas, Jehovah's Witnesses' position on the use of blood is controversial and is often raised as an issue of contention by an unbelieving mate. You want reasonably to stress the fact that you are not opposed to medical treatment. Rather, as a sound, thinking person, you desire to have medical treatment for your minor child in the event of a medical crisis. However, because of the scriptural admonition regarding blood and the many serious medical dangers associated with blood transfusions, you want to show your reasonableness in the fact that you have already investigated medical alternatives to the use of blood. You should be prepared to talk about these alternatives in some detail, showing that you are capable and prepared to care for the child's physical needs. 
Here, the Jehovah's Witness is told to make the claim of personal investigation, when in fact, it is the Watchtower Society which has done the research and drawn conclusions for them. It is a fact that a Jehovah's Witness is prepared to believe the society over any medical expert, even while his child lies near death. The Watchtower Society teaches Jehovah's Witnesses that blood transfusions are both medically unnecessary and very dangerous. They also teach that numerous safe and equally effective blood substitutes are available. They sometimes imply that physicians who recommend blood transfusion are either poorly trained or behind the times in their medical knowledge. Unfortunately, none of these teachings is either factual or true. Jehovah's Witnesses have in the past held strange views regarding other medical procedures besides blood transfusions. In the past, Jehovah's Witnesses have been forbidden vaccinations on the same so-called biblical grounds that they use to deny blood to their children. They have also regarded organ transplants as the eating of human flesh and cannibalism. While these procedures are no longer forbidden, they continue to hold to their doctrine of refusing blood transfusions on much the same grounds. Many times, psychologists give evidence in child custody cases. The organization has given instructions on how Jehovah's Witnesses should conduct themselves during these psychological evaluations. On page 55 of Preparing for Child Custody Cases, Jehovah's Witness parents are told that they should not de-emphasize the importance of their child's life. What exactly are they talking about? Here, the Watchtower Society is concerned that Jehovah's Witnesses do not tell the psychologist of their preference regarding their dying child. That preference is for their child's life in the new world of the future, after Armageddon. Jehovah's Witness parents are afraid that should their child receive blood and die, he might be in danger of not being resurrected. Carolyn Waugh, the Watchtower attorney, admitted that under the stress of a court-ordered transfusion, Jehovah's Witnesses have been known to say, I would rather see the child die than break God's law. She also said, Do you love your child more than your religion is basically what is posed to a parent in this type of situation. The court focus is supposed to be on the best interest of the child. And although a parent may choose to follow their religion over following what's necessary for the child's health, a court would say saving the child comes first and we will not be applying our own religious presumptions. Recently, a patient of mine underwent extensive surgery for cancer. He lost a fair amount of blood, which is not unusual, and which is routinely replaced by transfusion. He refused blood, however, as a Jehovah's Witness, and as a result, suffered a heart attack which was nearly fatal. While he survived the crisis, his recovery was greatly prolonged. Tragically, however, children are often affected by this policy. Many lives have been lost or adversely affected by this kind of misinformation. Not only are the parents made to sacrifice their own children, but the children are taught to be prepared to die for the organization they serve. Ledoux was a case I cited, a Nebraska case involving uh, two parties named Diane and Edward Ledoux. The court said my children would be harmed by my JW ex-husband's beliefs since they were not mine. To allow that, the court said, could be disastrous to my children. I thank God that the Nebraska Supreme Court cared about my kids. I think the most important uh, evidence that I re received were publications of the Watchtower Society itself. I think for the average uh, non-initiated person, the book Preparing for Child Custody Cases is enlightening, but you still have the problem that you almost invariably have in litigation involving uh, Jehovah's Witnesses and custody issues. And, and in order to find out and to see what the dimensions of the problem are, you almost 
of necessity must correlate it to that, to the uh, refutation. Because if you go through the preparation book and then go through uh, almost simultaneously the refutation book, you can see, you begin to see what the pattern is, really understand what's going on in that preparation book. So it's, uh, I guess the answer is, it's a, it is an essential part of the preparation. In conclusion, the legal profession and those associated with child custody cases should be aware of the facts presented in this video.